now a hearing on subpoenaed White House emails. The House Government Reform Committee on Thursday heard from White House Counsel Beth Nolan and Assistant Attorney General for Legislative Affairs Robert Rabin. They testified about White House and Justice Department activities since the discovery of a computer glitch that may have prevented White House emails from being presented to Congress. Indiana Congressman Dan Burton chairs the four-hour hearing. The committee will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that uh, all members and witnesses' written opening statements be included in the record without objection so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that all articles, exhibits, extraneous, or tabular material referred to be included in the record without objection so ordered. Since this is a continuation of last week's hearing, we'll follow the same rule starting with a half hour of questions on each side and then going to the five minute rule. As I said, we're going to continue the hearing we began last uh, Thursday into the White House email problem. Today we'll hear from White House Counsel Beth Nolan, and welcome. We appreciate your uh, patience because last week we anticipated having you, and then we found out uh, additional information about the emails, and we thought it would be better to wait till this week because of the additional information we were looking into. So we appreciate your, your uh, bearing with us. We'll also hear from Assistant Attorney General Robert Rabin. Uh, is that pronounced correctly? Is that Rabin? Rabin. Rabin? Okay, Mr. Rabin. I'd like to briefly review what we learned last week. First, we heard from a panel of Northrop Grumman employees. They operate the White House email system. Two of them discovered the problem. Two and a half years worth of e incoming emails weren't searched to comply with subpoenas from a number of independent councils, our committee, and others. They were called into a meeting with two White House officials. Their testimony about that meeting was pretty vivid. They all remembered that they were ordered to keep the email problem secret. They all remembered being ordered not to tell their bosses about it. Several remembered being ordered not to tell their spouses about it. One remembered being told there would be a jail cell with his name on it if he told anyone. Three people remembered the jail cell comment. One woman felt threatened enough that she risked being fired from her job rather than tell her boss about it. She told her boss, quote, I'd rather be insubordinate than go to jail, end quote. We then heard from the two White House officials who conducted the meeting, Laura Crabtree, now Laura Callahan, who was in the room. Mark Lindsay was on a speaker telephone. Ms. Callahan testified that she never threatened anyone. She said she never told anyone they would go to jail. Mark Lindsay couldn't remember the phone call or the meeting at all. He couldn't remember a follow-up conversation he held with a Northrop Grumman supervisor who was angry about the meeting. However, he was absolutely sure that he didn't threaten or intimidate anyone. I don't understand how you can be so sure of what you said in a conversation that you can't remember, but that's his testimony. So we have two very different accounts of the same meeting. How do we reconcile that? The only thing we can do is look into who has the motivation to tell the truth and who has the motivation not to. It's clear that the Northrop Grumman employees were in an uncomfortable situation. Northrop Grumman has a contract with the White House. They could lose that contract. The contractors have to work with White House officials every day. If anything, they had an incentive to soft pedal what happened, not to rock the boat. They didn't do that. On the other hand, Mr. Lindsay and Mrs. Callahan are accused of doing something that is really wrong. They're accused of trying to intimidate people who work for them. They're accused of telling people to hide things from their supervisors. The morning of our hearing, the Justice Department announced that they were going to open a criminal investigation. Mr. Lindsay and Mrs. Callahan are potential targets of that investigation. They had every reason, if they wanted to, to give misleading testimony or to engage in selective memory loss, which seems to be an epidemic at the White House. Given the fact that the Northrop Grumman contractors have no incentive to make allegations against the people they work for, and every incentive not to make those allegations, I believe greater weight has to be given to their testimony. 
I have to come to the conclusion that their version of events is much closer to the truth. That's where we left matters last week. Today we focus on another facet of this problem. In many respects, it's an even more important facet. That is, when did the White House Counsel's Office find out about this mess, and what did they do about it? Here's why that's important. Northrop Grumman isn't responsible for complying with subpoenas to the White House. Laura Callahan and Mark Lindsay are not responsible for complying with subpoenas. The White House counsel is responsible for complying with the subpoenas. When the counsel's office finds out about a problem like this, they have an obligation. They either have to go get the information that wasn't searched and turn it over, or if they can't, they have an obligation to tell us and others who have subpoenaed information, like the independent counsels, that there's a problem. The White House did not do either. As I mentioned last week, the White House has a track record on subpoena compliance that's not very good. We fought with the White House for four months in 1997 for documents in the illegal fundraising investigation. We had to threaten to hold the White House counsel, Mr. Ruff, in contempt to get the documents. White House lawyers ignored their responsibility to the Congress and to the American people. Then in October of 1997, months after they told us that we had all of the records, the White House found hundreds of videotapes of the President and the Vice President at fundraisers. They claimed that it was an honest mistake. In the White House database investigation, they withheld a staffer's handwritten notes from the committee for more than a year. Those notes indicated that the President had expressed an interest in the White House database, being compatible with the DNC database. These are just a few examples of the problems that we've had to deal with. The track record is pretty clear. Complying with subpoenas is something this White House does as a matter of last resort. The illegal fundraising investigation is just one area where we've been affected by this problem. We've been conducting an investigation into the Waco standoff. We subpoenaed documents from the White House. We were never told that potentially hundreds of thousands of incoming emails were not searched for information on Waco. We conducted an, inv an investigation into the President's decision to grant clemency to 16 Puerto Rican terrorists. We issued two subpoenas to the White House for documents. I want to read you a paragraph from the response that we, re that we received from the White House, and I quote, we have been in the process of searching archived emails for materials responsive to the committee's subpoena. In close, please find the responsive documents." End quote. That was last October. The White House Counsel's Office had known about the email problem for more than a year when we got that memo, and they didn't tell us. Why wasn't this committee ever informed that two and a half years of incoming emails were never searched? Was the Justice Department informed? Were the various independent counsels informed? Those are questions that we want to address at today's hearing. We know that high-level White House officials were informed about the problem almost immediately. On June 19, 1998, the Deputy Chief of Staff, John Podesta, and the White House counsel, Charles Ruff, got a memo. It explained the problem in detail. The same day, June 19, Mark Lindsay apparently met with Mr. Ruff and Cheryl Mills, the President's top two lawyers, to explain the problem. Just one day before that, one of the Northrop Grumman contractors prepared an estimate, 246,000 of the more than 1.3 million emails that were on the server had not been archived. That's nearly one in five. I've had a chance to review Ms. Nolan's testimony. She states that Mr. Ruff was informed of the problem but that he never understood the full extent of the problem. The President's counsel never understood the full extent of the problem. I seriously doubt that explanation. This issue isn't very complicated. There's a huge body of information that to this day has never been reviewed. If documents are withheld once, we can try to understand. If it occurs twice, you have justifiable doubts. But when it happens over and over again, and not just here, but with the independent counsels and Senator Thompson, you start to get a little skeptical. In addition, the selective memory loss that almost every witness has when they come before this committee from the White House also causes doubts. 
Mr. Ruff had no intention of turning documents over to us in 1997 until we forced him to by starting to move a contempt citation. Mr. Ruff and his staff told us that they had no idea that there were hundreds of videotapes of the president at fundraisers, even though his staff had drafted memos on the subject. They didn't know about them, but they'd already drafted memos on the subject. And now we're being told that although Mr. Ruff knew about the email problem, he did not fully understand it. With all those subpoenas coming in for all this information, all this evidence to the White House counsel, and he didn't understand it? It would be easier to believe that if the White House had a better track record. Ms. Nolan didn't become White House counsel until August of 1999. In her statement, she says that she wasn't informed until January. She lays out the timeline of when she informed various agencies conducting investigations. I want to tell you what bothers me about this sequence of events. On March the 7th, my staff interviewed the Northrop Grumman contractors. On March the 8th, I wrote to Ms. Nolan to ask her why we'd never been informed of this problem. I also wrote to Attorney General Reno to ask her why the Justice Department had not looked into it. On March the 10th, two days later, the Justice Department called the White House to ask them what was going on with the emails. On March 15th, the White House Counsel's Office provided an explanation to the Independent Counsel's Office. On March 20th, the White House gave the Justice Department a written explanation. The White House, was first, the White House first discovered this problem in June of 1998. The Justice Department has known about it for some time. They've been representing the White House in the Filegate lawsuit. It was on the front page of the Washington Times in February. Yet nobody seems to do anything around this town until our committee starts interviewing people and writing letters. That's just wrong. I shouldn't have to embarrass people to get them to do their jobs. This is almost the same thing that happened with the Justice Department's interviews of the President and the Vice President. We had to force the Justice Department to turn those interviews over to us. If we had not done that, nobody would have known that they never asked the President or the Vice President one single question about their foreign money contacts. Two years ago, FBI Director Louis Free and Prosecutor Charles Labella tried to get the Attorney General to appoint an independent counsel for the illegal fundraising investigation. They both wrote long memos to Janet Reno. Those memos practically predict this email mess that we now have. Director Free and Mr. Labella both understood that the Attorney General had too many conflicts to investigate her boss and other top aides and people at the White House. They both understood that the Justice Department would not be aggressive in pursuing evidence from the White House. And that's exactly what has come to pass. One of the most amazing things to me is that the Justice Department is on both sides, both sides of this email issue. The Civil Division is representing the White House in the Filegate law lawsuit. They're working with the White House to delay production of the emails. The Campaign Financing Task Force, which has always been a paper tiger, is now investigating whether obstruction of justice is, has occurred. It's pretty likely that the Justice Department will have to investigate its own conduct in covering up these emails. Today, I sent a criminal referral to the Justice Department about possible perjury committed by Daniel Berry, a White House staffer who testified before the committee last week. In July 1999, Mr. Berry filed an affidavit, sworn affidavit, in the Filegate civil suit. In that affidavit, he stated that the White House emails were archived in the armed system. He did not say anything about the mail to problem, even though he had known about it for over a year. That's perjury. The worst part of it is that Mr. Berry's affidavit was prepared by lawyers from the Justice Department and the White House. They were representing him at the time. They may have known that the affidavit was false and allowed Mr. Berry to sign it and submit it to the court. That conduct should be investigated as well so we can find out whether there was a criminal conspiracy to provide false testimony to a federal court and cover up this problem. You know, on a personal note, it makes me sick to think how Mr. Berry was used by the White House and the Justice Department. I don't think he's a bad person, but now he's in a lot of trouble. I wonder if anyone even cares in this White House or the Justice Department. The problem is that the Justice Department cannot be expected to investigate these charges. They would be investigating potential criminal conduct 
by their own lawyers. It's just one more example of why the Attorney General needs to appoint a special counsel who is truly independent. It's an intolerable situation. The Attorney General should have listened to Mr. Free and Mr. Lobella two years ago. She should have appointed an independent counsel. If she had, maybe the President would have been asked at least a few questions about the finance scandal, the campaign finance scandal, about James Riotti, John Wong, or Charlie Tree. Maybe the Vice President would have been asked at least a few questions about the Shilai Temple. Well, the independent counsel law has now expired, and the only alternative is for the Attorney General to appoint a special counsel. However, the least she can do is appoint this special counsel to get to the bottom of the email mess. I've called on her to do so. I ask unanimous consent to place my correspondence with the Attorney General about this matter into the record at the conclusion of my statement. The Justice Department can't be on both sides of this issue. It's fairly clear that the Department is not going to be aggressive in pursuing these emails from the White House. The only answer is to appoint a special counsel to do the job. In the next few days, I'm going to introduce a resolution on the House floor calling for a special counsel. I invite all of my colleagues to be co-sponsors. Mr. Rabin, Rabin, Mr. Rabin is here from the Justice Department. We're going to be asking Mr. Rabin some questions about when the Justice Department first learned about the missing emails. We're going to ask what's been done about it. We're going to ask for an explanation of how the Justice Department can possibly be on both sides of this conflict. Mr. Rabin, I hope you'll be candid with us and give us as much information as possible. And I want to thank you and Ms. Nolan both for being here. And I now recognize Mr. Waxman for his opening statement. Mr. Chairman, I want to welcome Beth Nolan and Robert Rabin to today's hearing, and I'm looking forward to hearing their testimony. Last week's hearing was instructive. We learned that no one in the White House had any role in developing the message retrieval system. We also learned that no one in the White House asked that any email messages be excluded from the system, and that before June 1998, no senior officials in the White House even knew that some email messages were being excluded from the retrieval system. By June 1998, however, senior White House officials were informed that a computer glitch existed. It is important for Ms. Nolan to provide information on how senior officials reacted to this information. Did anyone at the White House try to keep any information from investigators, or was there simply a misunderstanding between computer technicians and White House lawyers. Deliberate concealment would seem to be a case of obstruction of justice. Honest confusion, on the other hand, would be regrettable but understandable. And until we know the facts, we should be careful about making unsubstantiated allegations. There is, unfortunately, already a need to clarify several important points. During last week's hearing, a significant amount of time was focused on the question of whether Northrop Grumman employees were threatened with jail. Mrs. Callahan denied ever making the threat. But let's put that denial aside for the moment. Let's just look at the testimony of the five employees. Mr. Haas, who seemed credible to me, clearly believed he had been threatened with jail by Mrs. Callahan. He told us that in a meeting with Mrs. Callahan and his four co-workers, he flippantly asked what would happen if he discussed the computer glitch with others. He remembers Mrs. Callahan warning him that, quote, there would be a jail cell with his name on it, end quote. Betty Lambeth agreed with Mr. Haas's recollection and added that in a second meeting she had with Mark Lindsay and Paulette Shishon, a second threat by Mr. Lindsay was made. Sandra Golas initially testified that while she remembered the word jail being used in the meeting, she couldn't remember who said it. But she later said she did feel threatened and thought jail was a real possibility. Yiman Salim and John Spriggs both of whom were in the meeting and both of whom seemed credible, have no memory of jail ever being discussed. Ms. Salim testified that she 
never felt threatened, and both said they believed Mrs. Callahan acted reasonably under the circumstances. As I said, I'm putting aside Mrs. Callahan's denial regarding the threat, and in reviewing last week's testimony of just the five Northrop Grumman employees, I'm not comfortable in reaching any conclusion on whether a threat was made. There is a very real conflict between credible witnesses, Mr. Haas, Ms. Salim, and Mr. Spriggs, that I think it makes it irresponsible to issue final judgments about what happened. Ms. Lambeth also testified that in a second meeting with Mark Lindsay and Pauline Shishon, Mr. Lindsay told her that if she discussed the email problem with anyone, she would lose her job and be arrested. But I have a signed statement from Ms. Shishon, who was in that meeting. And Ms. Shishon says that never happened. In fact, Ms. Shishon says that, quote, at no time during this meeting did I perceive Mark threatening Betty or myself. And at no time was a threat of jail mentioned or any other threat. If any threat were made, I would have certainly remembered it and I would have taken the appropriate action in response, end quote. I should point out that Ms. Shishan has spent almost all of her career in the private sector and no longer works in the White House. Well, also in last week's hearing, Ms. Lambeth testified that the missing emails contained information relating to the FBI files, Monica Lewinsky, and the campaign file investigation. How does she know that? Well, she said she was told this by Bob Haas. But Mr. Haas, who was at the table, was asked whether he said that. And he said he didn't. Uh, and I want to show a tape uh, to refresh. But there are some discrepancies uh, in, in what it is you, you've presented to us, and I, I would like to start with those, and Mrs. Lambeth, uh, I'd like to start with you. Uh, I've been supplied with, a, uh, uh, I believe, an affidavit that you've executed, um, and uh, I want to read you a couple paragraphs and see if you're still affirm to that today, and then it involves a couple of your cohorts here, Mr. Haas and, and Mr. Berry in particular. Uh, I'd like to read you this paragraph, a contractor for Northrop Grumman. Uh, whom I supervised and who examined this group of emails, told me the emails contained information relating to Filegate, concerning Monica Lewinsky, the sale of Clinton Commerce uh, Department trade mission seats in exchange for campaign contribution, and Vice President Al Gore's involvement in campaign fundraising controversies. Did you attest to that under oath somewhere? Yes. And do you still stand by that today? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Okay, and the the contractor for uh, NG that you supervise, is that Mr. Haas? Yes, it, it is. Mis she said she, you told her. Did you tell her that you knew the I contents? I never, ever intimated in any way, shape, or form that I knew any content of any emails other than the two Monica Lewinsky documents. To that point, there was lots of conversation within our group as to if there was ever found to be a large content of anything involving these five or six different events, it would be a different story. But if she may have misunderstood that to say, I saw something in there, but I have never, ever seen anything in those documents except for the two Monica Lewinsky documents. Well, I, uh, I'm not uh, finished, Mr. Chairman. Um, I do want to complete my statement. I, I wanted to show that videotape because we had a clear contradiction in testimony. Uh, in fact, we had a clear contradiction in testimony with Ms. Lambeth on three separate issues where she testified one way and others testified that she was wrong. Uh, she said that she knew the content of these uh, emails and she said she knew them because of Mr. Haas. Mr. Haas said that he never told her. Uh, she said that uh, Mr. Hawkins and had one version of her employment status. Mr. Hawkins denied that and uh, we also have this contradiction now today with 
Ms. Shishun uh, making a, a statement about how she was wrong about saying there were second threats. The point I'm making is we have a conflict in testimony. And um, I was struck by the fact the chairman has asked for a criminal indictment against Mr. Berry for his statements, which didn't go as far as one might would have wanted him to go in describing the 1994 reconstruction status of the uh, armed system. But I looked at his uh, affidavit. And I think if you look at it in context, uh, it seems to me to say that there ought to be a referral of criminal charges for that affidavit is uh, not a level way to treat witnesses who may have said things that may have been false. Statements are often false. Whether they're intentionally false is another issue. And uh, I, I would um, be shocked if uh, the chairman would say that Ms. Lambeth ought to have a criminal prosecution against her false statements made to us. Uh, we ought, if we are going to accuse people of crimes, do it for everybody who says something false, not just those who don't say things that fit in with the theory uh, that we want to advance. Yesterday, was a, yesterday there was a front page news story that claimed that the White House withheld the Monica Lewinsky emails that were discovered in 1998. I believe that story is likely wrong. When Mr. Haas discovered the missing emails in 1998, they were compared to the emails that had already been given to the independent counsel. It's my understanding that the comparison indicated that the Haas discoveries had previously been provided to Mr. Starr. Well, good investigators find the facts first and reach conclusions later. That should be our standard, and it should be our objective uh, today. Mr. Chairman, I want to ask unanimous consent to put the uh, statement by uh, Paulette uh, Shishon in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Does that conclude your uh, opening remarks? That concludes my opening comment. We will now welcome our panel uh, to the witness table, uh, Beth Nolan and Robert uh, Rabin. I got that right. Yes, sir. Robert Rabin, please stand and raise your right hand, please. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? You see. Thank you, Ms. Nolan. Uh, you're now recognized if you so desire to make an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Congressman Waxman, members of the committee, my name is Beth Nolan. I am counsel to the President of the United States. I have held this position since September 1999. I appear today to address the email system used by the Executive Office of the President. As you know, last Thursday I submitted a written statement in anticipation of my scheduled appearance for that day. I ask that it be made part of the record. As I explained in that statement, my staff and I have devoted a large part of the past several weeks trying to understand these issues and gathering information to help us understand the matter and how to address it. We have been learning additional information about these matters almost every day. Although the new information assists us in better understanding the problem, it can alter previous assumptions, determinations, and conclusions. Therefore, although we have learned more about this matter over the past several weeks, we are still reviewing issues, exploring certain remedies, and probing some outstanding questions. For these reasons, I want to emphasize that my testimony today is based on my current understanding of the information that we have gathered in the course of our initial review. As our review progresses to completion, we, are li we will likely uncover information that alters or amends these preliminary conclusions. Indeed, in one week, I have learned additional information since I submitted my statement, and I want to update that statement as follows. First, 
The Office of Administration has informed me that it has contracted with a private entity to provide the technical expertise and resources necessary to restore the backup tapes to an easily searchable form. The contractor's preliminary estimate and I want to emphasize preliminary because these estimates are subject to amendment as the process um, proceeds and the contractor learns new information. The preliminary estimates suggest that the requisite equipment and other resources for the project will be in place, tested, and ready to go in approximately 70 days. We anticipate conducting the restoration in batches so that we can have a rolling production. The contractor estimates that this part will be completed in about 170 days from the beginning of the project. In other words, if, what, if these initial estimates hold up, we could have the backup tape searched within six months. We, uh, finally, the contract also calls for independent validation and verification which means that a completely different private contractor will come in and certify that this project is proceeding in a time and cost effective manner. Second, I would like to address media reports yesterday of a so-called zip disk and the suggestion that the disk contains previously undisclosed email messages. Those reports were confusing and misleading. As uh, Northrop Grumman employee Robert Haas told the committee last week, in June 1998, he conducted a search of uh, email accounts for Lewinsky-related materials. Mr. Haas gave the results of that search to his superiors, who ultimately turned them over to the White House Counsel's Office, which determined that these emails were duplicative of ones that had already been produced. At the same time, Mr. Haas saved the results of his search on a file of the F drive of his computer. The zip disk, which as I understand it is a computer disk able to hold more information than a regular diskette, referenced in yesterday's press, is simply a copy of the file maintained on Mr. Haas's computer. The data on the disk was neither newly discovered nor previously undisclosed. Third, Last week, I stated that I instructed Security Officer Charles Easley to conduct a review of the allegations of threats. In light of the Department of Justice's announcement that the Campaign Financing Task Force will be conducting a criminal investigation of this matter, I have instructed Security Officer Easley to postpone any review of this matter until further notice so that we can ensure that we do not interfere with that investigation. Fourth. I stated last week that there were approximately 550 backup tapes from the office of the Vice President. Security Officer Easley has indexed the OVP backup tapes from uh, ISNT, and I am informed now that the total number of OVP tapes is approximately 625. Fifth, I stated last week that 28 user accounts within the office of the Vice President have not been managed by ARMS, the Automated Records Management System. We now believe that there were only 24 such accounts, all but three of which were created before 1997. Since last week, um, ISNT has ensured that all 24 accounts, including the Vice Presidents, are now being ARMS managed. Finally, ISNT has not yet been able to correct the problem that incoming email to the OVP is not being captured by ARMS. So I want to make clear that the accounts are all being ARMS managed for email being created uh, in the office of the Vice President, but incoming email is not being ARMS managed. They are working to make that happen as quickly as possible. In the meantime, the counsel to the Vice President has instructed uh, OVP staff to retain e incoming emails um, other than purely personal email uh, on their servers, their individual servers. I now want to um, emphasize uh, the, the following points. The computer glitches uh, that occurred with the mail to and letter D problems uh, are the result of 
unintentional human error associated with an extraordinary electronic uh, records archiving system. No one attempted to hide responsive information from this committee or from any other investigative body. The EOP has produced or identified to this committee all responsive information that it located, including over 77, uh, 7,700 pages of email records in the campaign finance investigation alone. Until recently, the council's office was not aware of the scope and nature of these errors. In June 1998, the council's office thought the error was isolated to one search and had subsequently been fixed. That is, the council's office knew about a possible problem, but not the problems that we now uh, are talking about and understand. The council's office had no reason to believe that this error had any effect on its searches. Had it thought otherwise, it would have addressed the problem. The backup tapes of email records um, are secure. As I mentioned earlier, we have already begun the process that will enable us to search these records, and we will do so as quickly as possible. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to address this committee. Thank you, Ms. Nolan. Uh, Mr. Rabin? I don't have an opening statement, I have no sir. opening statement. Well, we'll get right to the questions. Uh, First of all, let me just make a real quick statement. I, I still find it very difficult to understand or believe that after the Northrop Grumman employees brought to the attention of uh, their supervisors and the people at the White House that uh, there was this glitch, that there wasn't a very thorough search of the incoming emails. Uh, you indicated that they thought they had covered it. But the fact is there were subpoenas from a number of independent councils, our committee, and everyone at the White House knew about the campaign finance investigation, the Lewinsky matter, and the other issues. And it seems to me that there would have been every effort made to make absolutely sure that a thorough, very thorough search was done. And if it was brought to the attention of people at the White House by the Northrop Grumman people that this glitch did occur, uh, then it seems to me that the, 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 the extent of the uh, uh, search into the missing emails would have been much more uh, thorough than, than it was. Now let me just uh, ask you a, a few questions. First of all, uh, two days ago when uh, he was asked about my call for a special counsel to investigate the email matter, uh, White House spokesman Joe Lockhart said, I think the Justice Department will have to make that decision. I will only remind people that, you know, Dan Burton asking for an outside counsel or a special counsel is like the sun coming up in the morning. It happens, you know, once a week or once a month. And you all will have to remember all of the pressing issues that he called for outside counsels on. And what came of them, end quote. Mr. Lockhart seems to be indicating that the president does not think that this is a very serious matter. Uh, is that the president's position? Mr. Chairman, the, the uh, president um, uh, has uh, asked me to make sure that we can get these searched as quickly as possible, um, and that's what we're doing. He, he uh, uh, takes that uh, very seriously. Uh, let me ask you a question, since Mr. Lockhart made that statement. Uh, do you know how many times uh, that I have called for an independent counsel? He said it's kind of like the sun coming up every morning. Do you have any idea? Mr. Chairman, I did not make that statement. I do not have any idea. Well, just so Mr. Lockhart and the American people would have the facts, I've only called for an independent counsel twice, not every morning when the sun comes up. And uh, one has not uh, uh, been appointed uh, for campaign finance and the email problem. And I'm in uh, pretty good company because the director of the FBI and Chuck LaBella also thought there should be independent counsels for the campaign finance investigation. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to call up uh, exhibit, uh, well, I'd like to say one more thing. He also <laughs> has said that we issued 700 subpoenas to the White House 
and that's only off by 670. We have issued 30 subpoenas to the White House, not 700. Uh, would you put up exhibit number GR-1? Is that uh, on the form there? This is uh, an affidavit. I don't, do you have a copy of that, Ms. Nolan? Uh, what is it, sir? It, it's an affidavit that was submitted in court in July of 1999 by Daniel Berry, a White House employee. I do have a copy. Okay. Did lawyers from the White House Counsel's Office assist in the preparation of that affidavit? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I know that lawyers from the White House Counsel's Office would have been working with the lawyers of the Department of Justice on this matter. I, I don't know if they assisted in the preparation of this particular affidavit. Well, we have been informed that they did, and if you could check on that, I'd appreciate Certainly. it. Uh, you don't have any idea of which lawyers from the White House were involved then? Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I know that um, uh, a, a couple of lawyers have worked on this matter before. As I said, I don't know the specifics of this affidavit. Uh, could you give me the names of the ones that you think? Yes, uh, I believe that Sally Paxton uh, worked on this matter at some point and Michelle Peterson. Yes, Michelle Peterson was one that we, we had uh, information that had been involved. Uh, Mr. Rebin, uh, Ray Ben, did Ray ben. lawyers from the Justice Department assist in the preparation of that affidavit? I, I don't know, sir. You, you don't know? Could you find out for us? Absolutely. Uh, we were told that Justice Department Civil Division lawyers were involved, and we have been informed that James Gilligan was the main DOJ lawyer, and we'd like for you to double check that. We believe that's I will accurate. find out, sir. Ms. Nolan, at the time that this affidavit was prepared in July of 1999, the counsel's office knew about the email problem, didn't they? Mr. July Bruton, of 1999. as I just testified, no, I do not believe that, at least when you talk about the email problem, if you mean the problem that we all know about and are talking about today, no. Well, they knew, they knew that the people from Northrop Grumman had informed Ms. Lindsay and Ms. Crabtree, and that had been kicked up to Mr. Podesta. Did they not, uh, did you not know that? What, it is my understanding, Mr. Burton, and of course I wasn't there, so uh -huh. this is my understanding, that Charles Ruff, then counsel to the president, knew or had been informed that there had been some kind of problem with an email search that a subsequent search was conducted in order to uh, see if uh, the emails uh, uh, had been missed, that that production was provided to the counsel's office, which compared it against emails it had already produced and determined that there had not, in fact, been uh, any missing emails. Well, but the point is uh, they, they did know there was an email problem. They knew that there had been a glitch which apparently had been fixed. They did not know that there was any ongoing or uh, larger email problem as far as I understand, sir. Mr. Rabin, uh, at uh, this time in July of 1999, the Justice Department Civil Division lawyers knew there was an email problem, didn't they? I don't know, sir. I don't know uh, precisely when uh, the department or Civil Division attorneys learned about it. Were you briefed about any of the questions that we might be asking or any of the information we might be seeking before you came up here? Because I read the your first few questions we've asked, you don't have any idea of what we're talking or don't have any answers. I read your, I read the statement that you delivered last week where you indicated what you'd be asking me, and I read a news account, and I saw that you'd be asking me. Well, this was one of the questions that, that I mean, was pretty apparent that we would be asking you if the Justice Department knew about the email problem. Uh, in July of 1999, and you say you don't know? July of 99? Yes. Y yes, I said I didn't know. You'd asked about July of 98, but I, I, I don't have the facts, and I know that that's a subject of an inquiry right now at the Department of Justice about exactly what we knew when. But well, I'm, I'm disappointed that, uh, you know, that uh, the Justice Department, since this is a very serious matter, uh, didn't work with you and prepare you more for the testimony that you're giving today. It's just, uh, it's inconceivable that you would come up here when we're asking these questions that are extremely important and, and, and not, not have any of the answers. Ms. Nolan, paragraph four of the affidavit states, and you have that in front of you, since July 14th of 1994, email within the EOP system administered by the Office of Administration has been archived into the EOP automated 
records management system, the ARM system. Uh, this statement is not true, is it? It's false. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could you explain to me why you think it's false? Well, I, I think the question pretty much speaks for itself. I'll read it to you again. Since July 14, 1994, email within the EOP system administered by the Office of, the Administ uh, of Administration has been archived in the EOP automated records management system. Now, it hasn't been, has it? Mr. Chairman, has it been archived in those in in, the, in that system? Uh, email was archived. It turned out that some email was not captured, but email was archived. Yes. Mr. Chairman, may I say something about this affidavit, please, if we're sure, going to sure. talk about it? Mm -hmm. It's my understanding that this affidavit was filed to explain what would be done, what the time and cost. Uh, would be involved for searching records regarding this case, which was uh, with respect to the FBI files matter. The important or relevant uh, information was how the system was set up, how long it would take. And as I understand it, they were particularly uh, thinking about the reconstructed email because the uh, activity that had occurred with respect to the FBI files was in 1993 and 1994. Um, I, I, so I, I just want to make that, that clear what this was about. This was not an affidavit saying uh, from Tony Berry saying we've produced all email or all email is captured. It was describing the system. Uh, for a potential email search. Uh, you, you know, you can give that explanation. But that is not what the affidavit says, is it? I mean, you've got the affidavit in front of you. You know what it says. Now, it doesn't say that, Mr. does Chairman, it? Mr. Chairman, could I uh, indulge you for just a moment? I just want to make absolutely certain, because as the witness was offering this, this explanation for uh, the, 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 the false uh, statements in the affidavit, uh, uh, citing a legal theory that is unfamiliar to me as an attorney and a former U.S. attorney, that the context in which uh, uh, an affidavit is uh, uh, providing uh, is provided can override uh, that it might be perjurious. And I just want to make sure we're talking about the same affidavit. We're talking, I believe, about the affidavit signed by David A. Barry on July 9, 1999, in which just above the date and his signature, the statement appears, quote, I declare on a penalty of perjury that the foregoing is true and correct, close quote. Is the witness talking about another affidavit that has some sort of limiting language in it? No, she's talking about the same affidavit. That's what I thought. Uh, Mr. That Chairman, is the same I, affidavit, isn't I it? asked if I could give you some context. I never said I was providing a legal theory. I asked if I could give you some context to explain the affidavit. Well, I That's think what Stone. I just did. Yes, ma'am. We'll get back to you. I'll, I'll get back to you with further questions later. I'll now yield uh, to Mr. Shays. I'd like to um, make reference to your. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to make reference to your close. You said, Mr. Chairman, in close, and I want to emphasize the following points: the computer glitches are the result of unintentional human error associated with an extraordinary electronic records archiving system. And then you said, even if we agreed with that, you then said no one attempted to hide responsive information from this committee or any other investigative body. What gives you the capability to make that claim? Uh, I uh, have um, uh, tried to make clear that I'm saying based on what I have learned and the people that uh, my office has, has talked to, I've found no indication that the council's office was aware that there was an ongoing problem or that anyone uh, sought to provide such, uh, to hide any such information. And uh, in fact, I believe that uh, several of the contractors uh, said that. Um, so uh, bottom line is, though, yes, last week as well. Before, uh, before you were there, these events took place, and then you make an assumption and tell the committee that no one attempted to hide responsive information, as far as you know. It's, it's, it's not an assumption. It is based on the information I have gathered. And as I said, I am only able to report what I have gathered and what I've learned up to date. Would you uh, put an exhibit WH1.3 uh, up, please?
just want to ask what the second to last paragraph means, um, where it says, for all of the categories of email, including ongoing internet email and email between EOP users, the system appears to have functioned as intended. Thus, emails in these categories, and then the parentheses, other than those that were specifically identified by EOP senders as non-records. What does that mean? Oh, what, what part of it, sir? I'm sorry. No, just the um, parentheses. What are non-records? When an EOP user sends an email, he or she uh, may indicate that it's a non-record email. It's not a presidential record or a federal record. Uh, if I were to send an email um, to my mother saying, I'll see you next week, that's not a presidential record. I can indicate it's a non-record. Well, the, the, if you bring the uh, letter down, just read up in the top. It's from Ginny, I guess. Ginny, Virginia Apuso wrote this memo. It was to John Podesta, who was then deputy chief of staff, and it was, in, it was, informing, um, uh, it was informing him of this problem. Uh, and would you just um, tell me who the signature is? That's Ginny, that's signature. Who is Chuck? Is that Chuck Ruff? I believe so, sir. What was the response? And so do I make the assumption, when, uh, what was the response of the White House Counsel's Office once it was informed of the problem? My understanding uh, is that Mr. Ruff discussed the matter with Mr. Lindsay, that he understood that it was a problem with a particular email search, that OA uh, through ISNT ran um, a search, which it turned out was a duplicate search of the server, produced those documents, turned out that, that if there had been a problem, it was fixed. In any event, there were no documents that hadn't already been found and produced. Now, we're talking about the mail to configuration issue. That's a, a two year and three month gap. I call it just a bottomless pit in which emails uh, got relatively lost or couldn't identify. Um, and then letter D configuration issues. Uh, what is GRS information technology operations and management records? What, what are you implying there? Was there a third problem? What am I implying? Where is sir? there? We have a problem with mail too. We have a problem with letter D. Do we have another problem in addition? Are you this, referring to the memo or? No, I'm referring to this document right here that you was accompanying oh, your presentation. That's something that a briefing, briefing that yeah. the Office of Administration gave Were there three problems me. or were there two? I, I don't believe that's a, that was a reference to how email records are going to be okay. stored generally throughout government um, uh, and uh, archives. The mail issue. to configuration problem was two years and three months, and the letter D configuration was seven months. Uh, do I make an assumption that we're talking about over 246,000 uh, emails? I don't know how many emails there are. We know that there are incoming emails uh, from the uh, from outside the complex into the uh, EOP. I, is it at least 246,000? I don't know, sir. Would you uh, look at page six in your testimony? You, you provided us this document here, right? I'm sorry, what is that? Exhibit NG1. Okay, it was provided by Northrop Grumman, and it's um, 200, and what was the number on it? 246,000? Uh, and the number, this is Northrop Grumman's document, and it's 246,000 emails. Um, let, me, um, let me just go on. I, I, I want to know, have you or anyone else discussed this issue with Mr. Ruff, and what did he say? Uh, I did discuss it with Mr. Ruff. I also believe other attorneys in my office discussed it with him. And when did you do him. that? Pardon? When? Um, I, uh, attorneys in my office discussed it with Mr. Ruff, I would guess about a month ago. I discussed it with him uh, last week or the week before. Uh, since learning of the email problem in the summer of 1998, has the White House informed the Justice Department of the problem? Uh, the 
as far as I am aware, the White House, uh, the White House Counsel's Office informed the Justice Department when we provided information uh, to the Justice Department so, campaign financing task. And when was that? In uh, March of this year. Has the White House informed any of the independent counsels of the problem? Uh, uh, we've had discussions with several independent counsel offices, yes, sir. Uh, and who are, the, who are they? Uh, Mr. Rays and Mr. Lancasters. And when did you have discussions with them? Uh, pr uh, February or March of this year. You can't be more precise than that? Well, I spoke, I spoke with Mr. Ray's deputy uh, the first week that um, I was aware of this problem. I think lawyers in my office spoke with Mr. Lancaster's office a couple of weeks later. I don't, I don't have the exact date. We provided a written explanation to Mr. Ray's office on March 15th. Okay, the email problem was discovered in the summer of 1998 at the height of the independent counsel's investigation of the president. The problem was kept from the independent uh, counsel during his investigation. Similarly, it was kept from the Congress during the impeachment debate. Did anyone in the White House think that the email problem could have, have re relevance to either the independent counsel investigation or the impeachment investigation. Uh, I want to make clear that uh, as far as I know, no one kept the information from anyone in the counsel's office. The counsel's office did not understand that there was a problem that needed to be reported. Uh, m the one possible problem the counsel's office understood, uh, they got a second search from the Office of Administration, which showed that everything had been produced. And therefore, Mr. Ruff did not believe there was anything he needed to notify any investigative body of. In your statement, um, you draw conclusions that everything is all right. And it seems to me that you give yourself the benefit of the doubt in every instance. So. Um, when you say, when the counsel to the president, Charles Ruff, was told by OA in 1998 that there were emails that may not have been captured in a previous search because of technical glitches, he understood that OA would be collecting these emails so that any responsive email that had not been produced could be produced. And then you say, thus, as Mr. Ruff understood the technical problem at the time, he did not think that the error had any effect on previous searches or that it might affect future searches of email records. As a result, Mr. Ruff had no reason to believe there was any need to notify investigative bodies of this area. What would have given him the reason to believe that? Um, I am reporting what uh, Mr. Ruff has told me, and uh, I think that he uh, he did not understand. I I uh, believe he was was communicated to him, or what he understood, whether it was a disconnect between the technical people who understood a much more complex problem and the lawyers. Uh, uh, I cannot tell you exactly why. What I can I mean, tell you is what he understood was that there was a small. There may have been a problem that it was fixed, there was no ongoing problem, there had been no documents not produced. Let, let, let me interrupt. Uh, sure. We'll get back to you. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to give the balance of my time to Mr. LaTourette, and we'll get back to you, Mr. Shays, in a little bit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, Ms. Nolan. I, I have a, a series of questions that I'll attempt to ask without getting on Mr. Waxman's highlight reel today. Uh, we had uh, we had the opportunity to have the hearing last week, and a number of the, our first panel told us uh, about the email uh, difficulty, and also, uh, although there were some conflicts uh, between witnesses and their recollections, they did pretty universally indicate that they had been uh, told to keep this in-house quiet, uh, um, to not spread it around the fact that there was a problem with the mail-to server and eventually then the D-mail uh, server. Did the Office of uh, Administration ever consult to your knowledge with the White House Counsel's Office about these instructions that this wasn't something to be discussed with others? I, I've never uh, heard anything that would suggest that was the case. Secondly, uh, some of uh, the contractors from NG last week talked about the threats of going to jail, losing their jobs, losing their security clearances, all things that were of obvious concern to them. Uh, would, 
from your uh, position at the White House as the White House counsel, uh, would White House personnel have any basis for making those statements if, in fact, they were made? Would White House counsel have... I don't know. Would White House personnel? In other words, we're talking about Ms. Callahan in particular. The allegation was she said there's a jail cell with your name waiting on it. Uh, is there any basis in, in law for uh, that type of threat? If and I understand that she denied it, but is there any basis that you're aware of to send someone for jail to jail for, for instance, talking to their wife about this this problem? Is it a breach of some sort of national security? That I'm, not, I'm aware not aware of, of any. I, and I'm, I'm wondering now, as I understand uh, the explanation that you've received from Mr. Ruff, I, I guess he had a meeting with Mr. Lindsay, and, and you're saying that Mr. Lindsay did not adequately explain it to Mr. Ruff or explain it to Mr. Ruff in a way that he, he understood that this was a two-part process, one, that uh, the stuff wasn't being captured, and once you fixed that problem, you had to restore the stuff that hadn't been captured for the over two years. Is that, is that what Mr. Ruff is telling you and, uh, and us? What, what Mr. Ruff uh, told me was that he understood there was a problem, but it was uh, a, a problem with one search, a search. He did not understand that there was a more systemic problem. But last week, Mr. Lindsay was here. He, he pretty clearly understands it. He, he knows that it was a two-part thing. One is that emails coming into the White House weren't captured. Uh, he worked real hard and I think spent $600,000 to fix that problem. But he, he also knew that, and continues to know, that there's this whole body of emails, 100,000, 200, it doesn't matter how many there are, but that haven't been loaded into the ARM system. Are you saying that Mr. Ruff, or the White House Counsel's Office had no comprehension that there's a series of emails out there somewhere that hasn't been reconstructed to this day? We know. You, you know it now. Uh, you I know, know it now. now. Yeah, yes. but, but what about Mr. Ruff? I, during the time that we were asking him for documents, he's saying he just don't, doesn't know? That's right. And, and you know, my, my historical recollection is that Mr. Ruff, I think, had was a prosecutor during Watergate, and I think he knew a lot about tape recorders and 18 and a half minute gaps, but maybe he hasn't sort of fast forwarded to the computer age. And that brings me to the Vice President of the United States. Your statement also talks about uh, the fact that the office of the Vice President wasn't tied into the ARM system. Is that right? Uh, that's right. The office of the Vice President was, was not fully tied into the ARM system. And, and one of the, I, I'm hard to provoke. I'm one of the more mild-mannered guys on my side of the aisle, but I, there was an article the other day in, in the Washington Times about the vice president who was interviewed about this, and his quote was that, uh, at first it says, the AP reporter says, he almost dared the Republicans to, to continue their investigations. I hope they spend a lot of time and energy on this, uh, Mr. Gore said to, to the AP with a confident grin as he leaned back in his armchair. Uh, that's, a, I, I think, a bad way for a guy to, that wants to be the president of the United States to uh, sort of further the cause of campaign finance reform and get information before the, the, the public. But you mentioned that... Um, in your statement that you gave us last week when you didn't come, you thought that there were 28 users. Now you know that there are only 24, and all but three were created before 1997. Who, who are the three created before 1997 that aren't being captured by the ARM system today? Uh, um, they are being captured now. As of this week, they are being captured. Um, Including incoming emails? Uh, no, the incoming emails are not being captured for the, for the OVP. Uh, uh, who are the three uh, I don't know accounts. the three accounts. I'm sorry. So, so you were able to identify that there's there's three people that were created before 1997, but you don't. There, there you, were. Uh, I think it is 21 created before 1997 and three after 1997. Okay. A and still today, uh, you know, when you're talking about this estimate of maybe we, hope maybe we can get this thing fixed in six months, and uh, does that include the office of the vice president, or does that just include the mail two and D servers? Uh, Problem. I think it includes the office of the vice president, but I'll have to check to make sure. And, and is it your uh, understanding from the information that you've collected that the, the problem with the vice president's server just came to somebody's attention last week? Uh, I think it was the week before last week. I think my statement said last week, but... Right, um, a but a couple of weeks ago. A couple of weeks ago, uh, yes. So, so it's the White House counsel's testimony through you, and I, I know you're new at it, and so we're talking about a whole range of, of White House counsels, but the knowledge within, the institutional knowledge within the White House counsel's office is that the, the vice president's office has not been tied up to the arms system since, since it was instituted after the Armstrong case, I guess, is how that came about, the arms system. Is that right? Uh, the arms system was developed after the Armstrong case. Of course, the Armstrong case dealt only with federal records. These are presidential records we're talking about now, but they were uh, meant to be made part of the arms system, yes. Right. Uh, but 
that nobody uh, nobody noticed that uh, and I understand in your testimony that Senator Thompson apparently got a couple emails from the vice president's office during he his got some, I don't know how many but but nobody many. said hey you know what uh, you know the, the guy that invented the internet and his staff don't seem to be doing a lot of emailing uh, and uh, so when we get these records production requests from be it our committee or Senator Thompson's committee or the special press uh, there, there aren't any emails from the vice president of the United States uh, nobody picked up on that uh, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know how many there were. I don't know how many were produced. So uh, I don't know th the answer to that, whether um, uh, somebody would have noticed um, the numbers. And, and I do want to make clear here that um, it, 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 it seems certainly from the testimony I'm aware of from last week that the technical people, the Northrop Grumman people, knew who was and who was not on the arm system right. but the lawyers doing the searches did not okay and, and and maybe the explanation for why nobody noticed the fact that there weren't any emails from the vice president during this time period in that same interview with the ap uh, he was asked how much he used his email during the 1996 re-election campaign and he said didn't he was pressed to go on he said just didn't so maybe maybe we're looking for stuff that isn't there because again the vice president of the united states indicates that he didn't send any emails in 1996 and so when we could reconstruct his office uh, we're not going to find them anyway uh, just as the yellow light goes on it, it's the white house counsel's position is that as far as you're concerned or mr ruff was concerned there was no delay in reconstructing these these tapes because you didn't think there was any need to uh, because you thought the problem was fixed the white house counsel thought the problem was fixed uh, and if not fixed everything that came up in this manual search by mr haas was duplicative of stuff that you'd sent us before and so uh, it, no big deal was the position at that time it wasn't a problem uh, yeah I, I don't think no big deal is the right characterization i don't think that the council's office understood there was any problem that, not not that it minimized it thank you very much thank you mr chair my time has expired mr Wax. Thank you. Just to follow up on a point that Mr. Latourette asked you uh, about, and that was the, uh, how many emails were produced from the White House regarding uh, 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 Senator Gore's, e uh, Senator Gore, uh, Vice, uh, Vice President, excuse me, how many emails were produced from the White House to Senator Thompson's in uh, investigation about uh, Vice President Gore? I think you should be able to get that information, and I wonder if you can ask somebody to get that information to us, perhaps before the end of the, today's hearing. I will if certainly try to do that. Okay. M may I say something about that, um, yes. too, which is that uh, there are a number of ways that OVP email um, uh, can can be produced or could have been produced. Um, uh, by searches of individual servers because they had been forwarded to an arms managed account because someone had retained a hard copy so um, I just wanted to make that clear in, in uh, response to Mr. Latourette's question about uh, the vice president email office of vice president email well I appreciate what you're saying but it is something within your control and I think it uh, uh, you can produce. Oh, I certainly no, us. certainly. We'll, we'll try to get the number for you so that we know what it is. Uh. Now, um, I appreciate both of you being here, and I think that you can help to clear up one of the central questions that's been raised today, which is, uh, what did the White House know about these emails, and what did they do about them? The panel from Northrop computer experts who testified last week told us that the technical problems that prevented emails from being Properly, uh, properly stored were the result of accidental mistakes made by government contractors. And I'd like to ask you about this. Ms. Nolan, were the problems with the White House email system the result of technical computer glitches, or were they intentional problems? Uh, it's my understanding that everyone agrees they were uh, technical glitches. Do you have any knowledge that the problems were the result of a deliberate effort to hide email from Congress or from other investigative bodies? I have no such knowledge. Uh, I know that this committee has made numerous requests to the White House for documents relating to the campaign finance investigation. The White House has produced over 90,000 pages of documents concerning campaign finance inquiries from this committee alone. Uh, what resources has the White House devoted to responding to requests 
from this committee? Um, the White House, uh, to respond to requests from this committee, um, has uh, used um, a number of lawyers, uh, the resources of lawyers, the resources of paralegals, um, uh, the IST resources in doing the um, arms searches, the Office of Records and Management uh, uh, does searches for us. We really um, call in a number of components of the Executive Office of the President. Of course, we send a directive to uh, people within the complex to uh, search their own um, files. So uh, I, I don't have a number. Um, but it's uh, an extensive amount um, of uh, uh, resources in order to produce um, documents, uh, videotapes, audio tapes, provide witnesses. Well, let me point out to you that I was curious about how much money might have been spent on this whole inquiry. You've given us 90,000 pages of documents just to this committee, and there are other committees and other investigators. And so in 1998, I asked the General Accounting Office to examine the cost of federal agencies of congressional campaign finance inquiries. GAO asked executive agencies to provide information on campaign finance inquiries received from October 1, 1996 uh, to March 31, 1998. And according to the responses to this GAO survey, White House employees had spent over 55,000 hours responding to congressional campaign finance inquiries at a personnel cost of over $2 million. That's the equivalent of 25 White House employees doing nothing for a year except responding to campaign finance inquiries. And I'd like to enter this GAO report uh, that I've had prepared uh, into the record and a related minority staff report on the cost of congressional campaign finance investigations as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to place this in the record. And what is that? This is a uh, minority staff report as well as a general accounting office re uh, report on the amount of money spent in responding to uh, these investigatory uh, inquiries. That objection. Uh, did the executive office of the president produce emails, records to this committee during that campaign finance in uh, investigation? Uh, yes, sir, they did. And how many total pages of emails did the executive office of the president produce to this committee in response to the campaign finance inquiries? My understanding is that it was 7,700 emails, pages of emails. Did the White House ever intentionally withhold any emails? Uh, I'm not aware that the White House ever intentionally withheld any responsive emails. I understand that in responding to the request for documents, the White House typically searches this ARMS computer archive for responsive material. Is that the uh, only kind of search that's done? No, the directive that goes out to uh, EOP employees asks them to search their own records, whether in uh, a paper form, computer form, or any other form. Uh, so individuals uh, should be searching their own servers on their PCs. So if, even if a document is not on the ARM system, it still could be found by searching an individual computer account. Is that right? Yes, and that is apparently what happened when the second search was done in June of 98 and the White House compared the, the, the documents from the server, it turned out that people who had searched their own records had already produced those documents. Is it possible that some of the emails that have supposedly gone missing uh, because of the technical problems with the arms retrieval system were nonetheless produced to this committee and others requesting documents from the White House? Yes, yes. In fact, Ms. Dolan, if I understand you correctly, all this talk about missing emails is a little misleading because it overlooks the fact that uh, while certain emails may have not been properly archived in the ARMS backup system, they're not necessarily missing. Is that right? They're not uh, necessarily missing. They may have already been produced. They may be on the backup tapes. I'd like to now turn to the chain of events that follow the discovery of a problem with the mail to uh, server in 1998. Uh, Mr. Lindsay testified that after he was told about the mail to problem, he notified the White House Council. Uh, I know that you weren't there at that time, 
but based on what you've learned, can you tell me what the White House Counsel's Office was told about the Mail 2 problem? Um, I, what I understand is that a problem was described to Charles Ruff, then counsel to the president, um, that uh, his understanding of the problem was that there had been a problem with a search, um, a possible problem with a search. Uh, he um, informs me that uh, he uh, did not understand um, the, uh, that a larger problem, such as the mail two problem or its nature or scope, um, existed. And uh, uh, it, it appears that uh, either that was not fully communicated or there was some disconnect. I don't know uh, precisely what was said. Uh, at last week's hearing, Mr. Lindsay told us about a test search that was then conducted to figure out the extent of the mail two problem. Can you tell us uh, why that search was requested? I, I believe, sir, that that refers to the second search that was done for the documents uh, that uh, might have been missing from the particular search that Mr. Ruff understood um, uh, was problematic. And what were the results of that search? The results of that search were that all the emails found in the second search uh, had already been provided to the counsel's office and produced. In other words, you, you, it's your testimony that the documents that were turned up in that test were turned over or were they not turned over? It is my testimony from my understanding that they were produced, sir. They were turned over. They already had been. Now, just to have a further understanding, these are emails that related to Monica Lewinsky, is that correct? That is right. That is my understanding. So, um, if I understand you correctly then, the email documents that were found in the test search were duplicative of the emails that had been previously turned over. So when they did the test search, they found the emails about Monica Lewinsky, and they found that these emails had already been turned over. That's correct, sir. So in your view, did it appear that there was not a problem? Uh, my understanding is that's exactly what, how Mr. Ruff understood it, that there hadn't, either there had been a problem and it was fixed, or there had not been a problem. But there had not, in fact, been, uh, there, there were no new documents found that indicated that uh, the production had not been um, uh, fully done. Yesterday's Washington Times ran an article that stated that the White House possesses a, quote, previously undisclosed computer disk containing emails by Monica Lewinsky that were sought under subpoena by a federal grand jury and three congressional committees, quote, but never turned over. Uh, the article stated that this disk, known as a zip disk, was given to Northrop Grumman's counsel, who passed it on uh, to the executive office of the president. Are you aware of a zip disk that was recently provided to the executive office of the president by Northrop Grumman's counsel? Yes. Th this is the, uh, 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 as I understand it, this is the record of Mr. Haas's F drive. And he, he apparently was the one who did this search. Uh, this uh, second search that we were referring to Mr. Haas uh, kept that, uh, the record of that search on his F drive. Um, and that is, uh, the, that's the same search. No previously undisclosed, no non-produced, uh, emails at all. So these are the same, this zip disk, does it contain the same emails that were result, that resulted from that search in 19, June 1998 that the White House had previously turned over to the various investigators. Is that, that, the, the, that the reference to these uh, previously undisclosed emails is wrong? They're, as far as I know, they are the same ones that were uh, had already been produced. Before this zip disk was handed over to the executive office of the president, did you know that it even existed? Uh, no, sir.
And uh, what do you know about the origin of this disc, just to have that on the record? My understanding is that um, a, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I'm not, I'm not sure of the exact date, that Mr. Haas made a copy of uh, what was on his F drive. And uh, he then provided it to Northrop Grumman Council, and Northrop Grumman Council provided it to us. I'm smiling because it looked like uh, we had different versions of some of the questions, but I think you made that point. And the essential point, as I understand, is that, is that what was on this zip disk was nothing more than the emails you had already turned over, and therefore the statement in the Washington Times that the disk, zip disk had uh, emails that had not been turned over is not an accurate statement. Is that your... I'm not aware of uh, any... Uh cache of previously undisclosed uh, emails on any disk. At last Thursday's hearing, we heard differing testimony regarding the content of the emails that were not captured by the arms as a result of this mail to glitch. Uh, as you saw in that video clip I showed during my opening statement, Betty Lambeth, uh, who was former uh, manager of Northrop Grumman's Lotus Notes team, stated that the emails concerned a number of different investigations. Uh, she said she learned this from Robert Haas, who was a member of Ms. Lambeth's Lotus Notes team. On the other hand, Mr. Haas testified he didn't know the content of these emails except for two relating to Monica Lewinsky. Ms. Nolan, based on your understanding of the email problem, who do you believe is right, if you have an opinion on this, between Ms. Lambeth or Mr. Haas? Mr. Haas's uh, testimony is consistent with what I understand about what the previous search was, which is that it was for emails related to the uh, Mon Monica Lewinsky investigation. Ms. Nolan, why wasn't Congress notified in 1998 when the White House email problems were discovered? Uh, uh, Mr. Waxman, uh, uh, the email problem that Mr. Ruff uh, understood might have occurred. He did not understand to have any effect on document productions. And uh, I think that uh, anyone who knows Charles Ruff knows that if he thought that there were a large number of documents that he had said had been produced, had not been produced, he would have done something about it. Why didn't you, when you were already in the White House Counsel's Office in January of this year, and you were briefed uh, on this issue, why didn't you notify Congress yourself? Uh, when I was briefed on the issue, it was part of a uh, larger pre-brief briefing for a post-transition presidential records um, meeting. Uh, I had uh, no um, understanding at that time that there were ongoing problems or effects on uh, searches. As soon as I learned that of the allegations that there were, um, uh, you know, we started to look at it. I want to yield some of my time to Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Nolan. Uh, I, I too, uh, Mr. Rabin, thank you for being here. Um, government service is not always easy, and. Um, just want to ask you just a few questions and just kind of pick up uh, where Mr. Waxman left off. In November of 1998, a decision was made to fix the uh, mail two problem uh, prospectively, so that all incoming external emails would be properly sent to arms. When this fix was made in November of 1998, what happened to all of those uh, unrecorded email records that were on the server at the time? Uh, it's my understanding that a backup tape was made of the server on the day that they restored uh, the ARM system on a going forward basis. And those backup tapes are uh, with um, in our security office now. Now, a second problem was discovered in April of 1999 that prevented incoming emails to users 
of a first name beginning with the letter D from being properly archived. Uh, this problem was apparently caused by uh, programming errors made by contractors in October of 1998. When this second glitch was fixed in May of 1999, what happened to all of those unrecorded email records that were on the server at that time? Uh Again, a backup tape was made, a snapshot of the system on, on the day that uh, the uh, uh, ARM system was fixed on a going forward basis, and those tapes are uh, also with our security office. So to the best of your knowledge uh, today, has the Office of Administration taken steps to protect those tapes? Yes, sir. How so? Uh, the Office of Administration has uh, placed the uh, backup tapes with Charles Easley, who is the Executive Office of the President's Security Officer, uh, and uh, he uh, has, uh, has those tapes, I believe, in a safe in his office. Uh, Ms. Nolan, can you tell me about what the White House is doing to reconstruct the non-archived emails? Um, the uh, Office of the Administration has been working to uh, get a contractor, which it, uh, uh, and it uh, signed a contract yesterday with an outside contractor to restore the backup tapes. And we, we particularly, I particularly ask that we make sure when we were doing this that, uh, that we go in two paths so that we get the backup tapes searchable as quickly as possible and we get the backup tapes restored to arms, but that we not delay being able to search the backup tapes by getting them on arms first. So we're working on two paths to try to get the backup tapes searchable as quickly as possible. Where are the backup tapes that, will, that are going to be needed to reconstruct a non-archive email? Those are also with Security Officer Easley. Now, when these backup tapes are put in an easily searchable format, does the EOP intend to, to perform keyword searches of these records to comply with this committee's subpoenas? Uh, yes. Yes, sir. Can you explain um, the problem that prevented email in the office of the vice president from being archived? Um, uh I don't know yet exactly how it happened that uh, email from the vice president's office was not fully put on arms. What I do know is that the vice president's office was on a different email system from the White House office and other components of the executive office of the president, uh, apparently at the time that arms was started in 1994, and that those accounts were not uh, uh, set up to be managed by arms at that time. Now, you stated that the executive office of the president had produced 7,700 pages of emails. Is that correct? Uh, to this committee? To this committee in the campaign finance investigation alone. Did those records include emails from the office of the vice president? Uh, yes, I believe they did. Does the fact that the vice president's emails has not been archived represent a deliberate effort to hide those documents from Congress and other investigative bodies? I've seen no indication that anyone was trying to hide these documents from congressional investigative bodies or any other investigative bodies. Now, when you made your statement early on, just uh, the early part of your presentation here, um, you made it clear that um, you're discovering information as you go along. Is that right? Yes, sir. Uh, do you anticipate uh, do you have any anticipation as to many changes taking place with regard to the statements you've already made to us or things you think you may find out? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I want to be clear. I, I, I don't know what I may find out later, but I think that uh, what's important to know now is we, we, we have uh, the backup tapes we have are secure with our security officer. We have an outside contractor on board to try to get these restored um, and searchable as quickly as possible. Um, uh, and, until we do that, I, uh, I, I can't say any more. Hey, thank you. I want to thank the gentleman for yielding. I yield back. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cummings. Uh, Mr. Raven, um, 
I want to ask you about the criticism the Attorney General has been receiving from, from Chairman Burton. When he originally called this hearing on March 8th, he wrote a letter to the Attorney General, and he uh, was pretty harsh in his criticism uh, because he criticized the Attorney General for not investigating this uh, email problem. And in fact, uh, uh, he was pretty, pretty strong about it, said the appearance created by this failure to investigate uh, seems to indicate that there, there's no interest, no intention of pursuing a vigorous investigation of the White House. And, and uh, so the Attorney General was being criticized for not investigating. Now the Justice Department, headed by the Attorney General, has announced an investigation. And the criticism by our chairman is that uh, uh, instead of applauding this investigation, he wrote an even stronger letter to the Attorney General on March 27, in which he said that, quote, because you and your staff are in charge, the proposed investigation is fatally flawed, end quote. So the chairman's saying, on the one hand, you didn't investigate. When you do, it's flawed, and he wants an independent counsel uh, to take over. But it doesn't end there, because yesterday, March 29th, the chairman, in a letter to Judge Royce Lamberth, wrote, recent efforts by the attorney general to control this investigation appear to be nothing more than a ploy to retain control over matters that will ultimately focus on how the Justice Department helped the White House in its efforts to refrain from producing documents to Congress and very, various independent councils. So to summarize, what I understand has happened is March 8th, the, the Justice Department is criticized for not investigating the emails. On March 27th, the chairman uh, decides that the Justice Department investigation that he requested is fatally flawed. And now, on March 29th, we learn that the Justice Department's investigation is not only flawed, it's part of some huge attempted cover-up. So, Mr. Rabin, it seems to me that the Attorney General is damned if she does and damned if she doesn't. Uh, whatever action she takes, the Chairman finds grounds for criticism. Uh, Ms. Nolan, let me just see if I can summarize where I understand some people are taking this investigation. Some people have a theory. They acknowledge that this problem with the arms retrieval system was flawed. And they recognize that the mistake was not because the White House caused it to be flawed, but when the White House found out that it was flawed and not capturing all the various emails, they tried to cover it up and threatened people who might make it public, uh, uh, particularly personnel who knew about the failure of the arms system to retrieve the emails. Now, of course, if this theory is true, this amounts to obstruction of justice. Uh, the, as I understand it, the, the White House counsel, Charles Ruff, when he heard about this problem, asked that a test be done to see where it was happening for the emails, what was happening with these emails that were not on the centralized arms system. And he used Monica Lewinsky as an example of a topic, obviously a pertinent one at the time, for the investigation. And when this test was done, uh, he found out that uh, the emails that were not, were not on the ARM system apparently were picked up because they were retrieved from the individual computers. And when they were uh, retrieved from the individual computers, and he found that they were of those that were already turned over to the investigators, it seems like he concluded there was no real world problem, that while the centralized system wasn't getting the emails, the search of the individual computers seemed to be picking up uh, these emails. So we're, we're talking about Mr. Ruff. I mean, he's the only one, if there's this cover-up, if there's this conspiracy, if there's a threat to witnesses that might make this public, that he would be the one in charge of this whole thing. But he went out and tried to make sure that they were getting all the emails to the appropriate investigative agencies. And he did this test to be sure that that was the truth, um, or at least as he understood it, that they, they weren't leaving anything out. Uh, we had testimony last week from Mr. Uh, Spriggs and others that it was their understanding the White House wasn't trying to cover up the problem, they were trying to correct the problem. 
there seemed to be some concern that Northrop Grumman might say, well, they, they, they're going to need more money to, to correct the problem. But the White House wanted the problem corrected. Is, is this a, a, a summary of what you understand to be the facts in this case? Um, let me clarify one thing um, where I, um, my understanding differs from what you just summarized, which is that my understanding is that Mr. Ruff understood the problem uh, to be related to this particular search. So he wasn't doing a test to see if the system worked generally, but rather was doing a second search for the particular search that there may have been a problem for. Uh, and when the files came back, which showed that in fact everything had been captured, it's my understanding that Mr. Ruff believed there had been no problem. There was no ongoing problem. Well, let me just say that I, I've worked with many people in the course of the time I've been in public office and beforehand. And I'm very careful to say anything uh, to vouch for anybody. But I, I've worked with Mr. Ruff, and I know uh, him to be uh, a man of integrity and principle. And um, in my mind, uh, there's never been any question about uh, his honesty and, uh, and integrity. And uh, I cannot believe this theory that would hold him responsible for some kind of cover-up and threatening of people and all the others, uh, other facts that would have to fit in, be shoehorned into this theory of, that would amount to a scandal. And if this is all there is, if this is what this whole scandal is all about, I, I must say I'm not, I'm not uh, very impressed that we have uh, found a, uh, a new scandal uh, to, uh, to wave, uh, the, to wave the ar our arms about and to uh, uh, carry on uh, as if the, there's something been uh, intentionally done uh, to frustrate uh, justice. I, I thank both of you very much for your testimony and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. I understand uh, Mr. Rabin uh, needs a brief break. And uh, Ms. Nolan, I think we'll allow both of you to have uh, 10 minutes, if that's all right with you, for a break. Yes. And uh, then uh, we'll get back to the questioning. So we stand in recess for 10 minutes. for the length of our uh, tour to the floor, but unfortunately, there were a number of votes. I will now recognize uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Micah, for five minutes. Thank the chairman, and I do have a question for uh, Ms. Nolan. Uh, first of all, uh, you have talked about uh, the suddenly reappearing uh, Haas uh, disk zip disk, I guess it's referred to, tapes um, in your testimony to us, your, your statement to us. And uh, that contains, um, was it 500 records or emails? Uh, sir, I don't know um, how many it contains. Uh -huh. uh, you, you also sort of indicated for the other side that those uh, uh, had matched uh, what was uh, given to the, uh, uh, ha had been possibly given to the independent counsel or to investigations. Is that correct, or were you told that? I was told that what, what Mr. Haas did was a second search in June or July, I'm not sure, summer of 1998, that that search produced, he did a second search of the server. Uh, that search produced emails which were provided to the council's office, which checked and found they were duplicative of emails already provided. Do you, that, and you, but you've not, you're not aware, you've not seen those 500 
uh, I have not yet, sir, no. And so you don't know whether they match. You don't know whether, uh, in fact, that uh, that information was the same that has been provided to the investigative body that required it. I, I know that Mr. Haas has described what, what he saved as the search that we looked at. Uh, you also uh, indicated that now there are uh, an additional number of backup tapes. Is that correct? Is it 620 some backup tapes? I, I think, sir, I'm, I'm not sure of the exact number. There are about 3,400 for the EOP altogether. There are about 625 for the vice president's office. Uh, as opposed to a, a lower number that had previously been uh, Last week, um, I had been told that there were about 550 vice president's uh, backup tapes. Now it's 625. Uh, and what? You, and uh, so there's, there's two bodies of information. One is the White House and one is the vice president's. One is the executive office of the president right. other than the... Okay. But some of those, some of the vice president's now, ones were with the EOP ones. Uh, we had heard from various witnesses or sources that there was information on the impeachment campaign finance, uh, uh, foreign campaign contributions, file gate. I heard also selling of trade mission seats and other things that were un under investigation by various panels or the special counsels. Are, you're not aware then of what's on any of these uh, tapes. Uh, there there, there uh, may in fact be a large number of, uh, of uh, files or records that have not been turned over. Is that correct? The, uh I don't know what's on the tapes. I, what I do know is that uh, we know that it's incoming email during those certain periods for the EOP and uh, the email for the um, OVP that we're going to have to reconstruct and then we'll search for the emails. And really all you know about what <laughs> Mr. Ruff uh, has, has said of his involvement, you, you said he knew that there was a technical problem, right? That's my understanding, yes. You, d you never got into the point that Mr. Ruff might have been told by Mr. Lindsay that not only was there a technical problem, but there was the problem that we had described to us that uh, people were talking uh, in the hallways about what was on the tapes and that needed to be hushed up. No, I asked Mr. Ruff if he had heard anything like that. He had not. You asked him specifically I, I that question. Yes, sir. So he said, and he told you he was only aware of the uh, only aware of the uh, technical problem. That's right. Um, what is DOJ doing as far as investigation? Have they requested any uh, files or information? Has D or does D will DOJ have access before anyone else uh, in their investigation of the materials that you have? Uh, w we have received a letter uh, from the Campaign Financing Task Force, as we did from other investigative bodies, asking us to explain the problem. We have not um, made any arrangements with any investigative body about uh, access or Has priority DOJ, of access. Has uh, DOJ met with anyone, uh, uh, with you or others, regarding this investigation? Uh, no, sir. They haven't to date? No, that's correct. Uh, DOJ, who's in charge of your investigation? Who's in charge of the investigation, the Campaign Finance Task Force? initiated the investigation. And even though this may go beyond that, they're still charged with that? They initiated the inquiry. And do you know what st steps they've taken? Mm -hmm. uh, have they requested access to any of the material that's in the possession of the White House at this time? I, d I don't have personal knowledge of all the steps that they've taken, sir. Um, Does the gentleman have any more real quick questions? I know he has to catch a plane and... Uh, well, uh, what, uh, uh, just could you provide just finally uh, some background about the head of security that's now in charge of the tapes, Ms. Nolan? Um, uh, Charles Easley is the EOP security officer. I know that he's a uh, longtime uh, government officer who has responsibility for reviewing background investigations and uh, making uh, determinations, security determinations within the complex. Finally, has your office uh, notified uh, the congressional committees or uh, the independent council or any of the other bodies who, uh, 
who had requested uh, information under subpoena that there may be existing files uh, or information that has now been uncovered. Has that been done? We've had a communication with a number of uh, independent councils and congressional committees. Um, I'm still trying to make sure that we gather information about every request that came in during could that period. Could you provide the committee, just for the record, a copy of those communications so that we could see who has been noticed that you have now uncovered some of this material that may have been subpoenaed uh, some three, four years ago? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and have a safe trip home. Uh, before I yield to uh, Mr. Barr, let me just real quickly uh, ask uh, one question. Uh, Ms. Uh, Cheryl Hall uh, has indicated that uh, she was told uh, by Mr. Haas, and Mr. Haas denied this at our hearing, but she was told that uh, he had information on his zip disk that uh, there were trips uh, on these trade missions that were offered for community for campaign contributions and also that uh, there was information on these zip disks uh, dealing with the vice president soliciting campaign funds now mr mr uh, uh, haas said before the committee that he had no zip disk that there was nothing at his home and uh, now we find that he does did have a zip disk uh, and so uh, i wonder uh, if uh, uh, you have taken, I mean, you indicated that there was some information that you had knowledge of on the zip disk. Do you have knowledge of everything that was on the zip disk? Uh, sir, the, Mr. Haas, as I understand it, made a copy of his F drive, uh, this, his server drive on the right. computer right. Um, within the past couple of weeks. Right. Um, uh, that, uh, that information, he has said, was what he did when he did uh, the search for Lewinsky emails. And he has said there's no other information. But do you have knowledge of what was on I don't. OK, well, uh, what has happened to that uh, zip disk? The zip disk, sir, um, was given to Mr. Uh, Easley. Um, my understanding is that uh, when they opened the zip disk uh, or tried to read some of the zip disk material, they couldn't read all of it. They went back to Mr. Haas's F drive, made another zip disk. Mr. Easley has that. They're going to try to open it and find the files. Well, I think we'll issue a subpoena for both the original zip disk and the one that was remade off of his hard drive. I think that's extremely important that we have, have that. Uh, one other question. Uh, you said that the uh, email system had something in it that would uh, uh, block out uh, emails from a mother or father or something like that. Did you say that? Um, what I said, sir, is that when a user sends an email, uh -huh. uh, you can well, I can indicate if I'm sending an email that it's non-record, that it's not a record, not a presidential record. A person from the outside can or the a inside? A person from the outside cannot do that. But the person from the inside can? The person from the inside can. Well, could somebody from the inside have, if they got a, a, an email from a friend like John Wong or Charlie Tree or Mark Middleton or Maria Shaw, could they have blocked that out? Uh, well, they can't block out. They, they, it still gets sent to arms. But my understanding is that there is um, some kind of regular review to see that n things indicated as non-records are in fact non-records. What does that mean? <laughs> well, uh, this is what I understand, uh, sir, that everything, the way that ARMS works is that when an EOP user who has an ARMS managed email account sends an email, it is always blind copied, BCC'd to ARMS, right. to records We're management. We're talking about an email from the outside, though, coming An in. email from the outside. The, the, the emails from the outside, because they can't be BCC'd to ARMS when they're written, I, they're scanned as the server is scanned about every, I think it's several times a minute. I, I know, I'm not I know, sure. but, but the point is you said they could you block. Can't, you can't block out any incoming emails. You and can't so they would automatically out. go to the arms? They system. would go to the arms. And you don't block out ones you write. You simply indicate that they're non-records. I'm only interested in the ones coming in. The ones coming in, no, you can't. All do of those of would that. be on the arms system or in this. If, if they were captured, if they, of course, during the Why mail. Why would they two, not be captured? Well, during the mail two and letter D problem, that that is exactly the problem. That incoming email to the complex for certain accounts, those that were 
coded as mail to all caps instead of mail to upper and lower case, or those whose uh, the recipient, the user, uh, first uh, first letter of their account began with D, were not properly scanned by arms, so they were not put in arms. That's what we'll be searching for on the backup tapes. I, I, I'm not sure I understand. Is there some way, any way, that an incoming email could be blocked by the receiver of the email mm -hmm. so that it would not be recorded on any other system, any other system? Not that I'm aware of, sir. You can't make a categorical statement. You're just saying not that you're aware of. Yeah, I, I, I'm not aware of any way. Um, hey, well, I guess when you were talking earlier, you said that there was some way that if somebody got an email from a relative or something. It no, could be I'm sorry, sir, if I was at all confusing about this. What I was saying is if I write an email that to my outgoing. mother, outgoing, um, I can indicate that it's a non-record. I see, but if it's an incoming. I can't do anything with it. It's definitely going to be recorded. If, uh, unless, of course, it, you have the scanning problems that occurred in the mail to and letter D problem. Mm -hmm. Well, if you find any additional information on that, I'd like to have that. Certainly. Okay. Mr. Barr. Thank you, Mr. Or, Chairman. Uh, is, is Mr. Barr now? Mr. Barr. Yes, thank you. Uh, Ms. Nolan, the, the ARM system, uh, that is not just some program that somebody decided they wanted to have. It's a very important program, is it not? Uh, Sir, it, it is an important program. Uh, and it provides the capability, does it not, for the White House to comply with uh, various federal laws that require uh, the retention and retrievability of emails, is it not? Uh, ARMS was set up in order for the Executive Office of the President to comply with the Federal Records Act. Um, it also is um, an effective tool for complying with the Presidential Records Act. But the Presidential Records Act doesn't uh, require um, that email be saved in any particular form, as far as I know. But it, it does require them to uh, be saved and be in a form that is retrievable. Is that not correct? Pursuant, for example, to the Armstrong decision in 1993. Well, of course, the Armstrong decision explicitly, um, the court explicitly said that it was not applying that decision to presidential records, only to federal records. Are presidential records not federal records? Is that the, your position? the law provides for um, two kinds of records, federal records, which are most agency records, and presidential records, which are those of uh, those who uh, assist and advise the, uh, the president, uh, the White House office. Vice presidential records are treated like presidential records. Um, some of the other units in the EOP Others, um, like the Office of Management and Budget, uh, are mostly um, federal records, not presidential records. But records such as those that were the, are the subject of this hearing and the hearing last week and, and future hearings uh, are subject to retention and retrievability, are they not? Uh, sir, I, w I want to be clear uh, on the, uh, the Armstrong decision um, compelled uh, uh, certain records management and retrievability for federal records. It did not address presidential records, so I'm not aware that there's a decision that says that presidential is, records... Is it your position, then, that, that presidential records, and maybe you ought to define those for us, uh, are not subject to the uh, uh, Armstrong decision? That's correct, sir. Okay, that is your position? Yes, sir. Is it your position also that the Privacy Act does not apply to those records? The, uh, yes, sir. It uh, is a uh, longstanding um, interpretation of the Privacy Act from the Justice Department, starting with its initiation, that it does not apply to the White House office and essentially to presidential records. Uh, in other words, uh, you take uh, strong exception to Judge Lambert's decision yesterday. I disagree with Judge Lambert's decision yesterday, yes, sir. Uh, because you believe that emails such as those that we're considering here, which are subject to subpoenas, for example, by the Office of Independent Counsel, this committee and the Impeachment Committee or the Judiciary Committee uh, do not apply to emails generated uh, by or from the White House? No. Uh, no, sir, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that question? I'm not sure I understood it. Okay, what we're talking about here are 
a large number of emails generated by or directed to employees of the executive office of the president and other offices within or connected with the White House. Is that correct? Yes, the problems with, okay. with the exception so that, of the that's OVP sort of the body, that's the body apply of, to the incoming, though, not the, not the email generated by. I want to make sure that so I'm clear the, about the, that. So your position, then, uh, is that the subpoenas, for example, those issued by the Office of Independent Counsel, subpoenas uh, for these documents by uh, this committee or by the impeachment committee, that you do not even have to comply with those because oh. they, they, they relate to outgoing emails? Absolutely not, sir. I, I, I hope I didn't say anything close to that. I believe I did not say anything well, That's why I like wanted to that. clarify, because it struck me as, as rather far-reaching, even, even for uh, this administration. You, I understood your question to be whether the Presidential Records Act or the Armstrong case require White House office records to be retrievable in an electronic form. I am not aware that there is any such legal obligation. Armstrong did not apply to presidential records, and the it presidential not, it records... It did not say they weren't covered, though. No, the court actually considered that question. Yes, sir. Your, your position is that the Armstrong decision expressly provided that emails going to the White House or personnel there or going out of the White House are not subject to retrieval yes. in an electronic format? Uh, no. Oh, uh, I am saying that the Armstrong case specifically excluded discussion of presidential records, which includes White House office records. It addressed federal records, and that was a specific um, a part of the case. The plaintiffs, my understanding is that the plaintiffs actually wanted it to, to address the court to address both, and it did not. So what you're saying is but there's, a, there's a, a loophole here through no which loopholes, you don't want to drive a Mack truck. No those, loophole. Those, but those, those same emails are properly subject, are they not, to, uh, to subpoena by the independent counsel and by committees of Congress. Is that correct? We've, we've uh, supplied thousands and thousands of emails pursuant to subpoena what you're requests. Saying, then, yes, though, they is are. That, yes, they are subject to subpoena, but if they happen to be in an electronic format and you all just happen to lose them or not know where they are, that you're under no obligation to search the records for them because they're not covered by uh, the uh, various statutes of the Armstrong decision? I've, uh, I, I didn't say anything like that, Mr. Barr. Do, does the White House recognize an obligation to have emails sent from or to employees in the executive office of the president stored in such a way so that they can be retrieved and be responsive to subpoenas issued by the Office of Independent Counsel or a congressional committee? Mr. Barr, the White House included White House office and presidential records emails in the ARM system, which is an automated retrieval system, even though it was under no legal obligation at the time to do so. It has used the ARM system to try to, to respond to subpoena requests. Uh, I don't think there's a, any suggestion. If I haven't been clear about this, let me be clear. There's no contention here that we were under no obligation to search and produce what happened was that the search did not produce certain emails because they weren't in the ARM system or may not have produced certain emails because they were not properly captured in the ARM system. The lawyers who were doing the productions were not aware that the ARM system did not contain those emails. Uh, on what basis do you make the statement that they weren't aware of it? Because it's my impression that they were through several means. Uh, first of all, Excuse through me, various... Excuse let, let, let me uh, say, Mr. Shaves, do you intend to yield Mr. Barr? I'm delighted to yield him my entire okay. time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there were uh, various articles written in the public domain back in 1998 that this problem did exist. Uh, Judicial Watch uh, furnished letters to Judge Lamberth uh, indicating on the record that this problem did exist. We had testimony just a week ago that there was a, in July of 1998, uh, that Mr. Haas did a search of several users' files for emails uh, regarding Ms. Lewinsky, uh, and that there were 
uh, a fairly significant quantity that were retrieved, and they were delivered to the White House counsel's office. He could not, or at least testify, that he could not remember to whom they were delivered or precisely when, and he professed to have no knowledge or record of when they were delivered. Uh, so it mystifies me to some extent, one, to hear you say that nobody in the White House counsel's office was aware that there was this problem, uh, or that these emails were not retrievable. There was testimony that they were retrievable. Uh, uh, sir. Specifically with regard to, uh, and I'm sure you're aware of the testimony last week by Mr. Lindsay, the other Mr. Lindsay, uh, that he did in fact deliver uh, this, this large set of emails that he had retrieved at the direction of Ms. Lambeth uh, to the White House Counsel's Office. Where are those emails? Uh, he, the, the emails were produced to the counsel's office. The counsel's office checked them against emails that had already been provided and produced and discovered that they were duplicative. So there were no new emails. But, but where as, are they? That is my understanding of the, the F drive, uh, uh, Mr. Haas's um, F drive, which has the results of that search is in the EOP and a zip drive, a zip disk of that has been made and that's with Mr. Easley. Uh, but wh where are the emails? The e they, were, they were hard documents. They were documents, the hard documents. that were delivered. Where are they? Uh, um, Mr. Barr, I'll find out. Well, is there any record of them having been delivered to the White House Counsel's Office in approximately July of 1998? Uh, um, a lawyer in the counsel's office remembers checking uh, emails against another uh, a set that we had produced and determining that they were duplicative. And who is that lawyer in the White House counsel's office? Uh, Michelle Peterson, sir. Okay. Uh, might I suggest, Mr. Chairman, that we subpoena Ms. Peterson? Maybe she remembers. I think that's a good idea, and we'll we'll plan on doing that. Okay. If it, would the gentleman yield for just a moment? Certainly. <clears throat> uh, now, Ms. Peterson, according to your testimony, said that uh, they were duplicates of what had already been given to various individuals, i.e. the independent counsel and, and uh, Mr. Hyde's investigation and so forth. Why didn't she just go ahead and send those over there instead of checking to see if they were duplicates? Because, you know, there's some question among some people about whether or not uh, everybody's been getting the straight scoop on what was going on over there and what was in these emails. For somebody at the White House who works for the president to say that they're duplicates, that uh, still doesn't erase all doubt. I mean, why didn't they just go ahead and send the hard copies over to the independent counsel and to the investigative committees that wanted them? M Mr. Burton, my understanding is that the counsel's office was informed that there was or might have been a problem in conducting a search that the second search was done. And I want to be clear that the search, as I understand it, was of the server. Um, which uh, is what Mr. Haas testified he did. Well, you, you, that second search showed that there had not been a problem because those documents had already been found, apparently, when people... I know, but that's not the, that's so not the question when I'm asking. People, when, when people conducted their own searches of their own servers. I understand. And so there was no, uh, I understand, there was no you, question. No, but the question is, you had hard copies of the email. They were sent... To the, count, to the president's uh, uh, chief counsel's office, Mr. Ruff's office. Uh, Ms. Peterson went through those and she said they were duplicates. But you see, those of us who are investigating don't want somebody at the White House to say they're duplicates. We want the hard copy so we can look at them and see if they're duplicates. Why weren't those forwarded on so that determination could be made by the relevant committees that had subpoenaed the documents? Uh, uh, sir, I'm, I'm not sure how to explain it any better than I have. If somebody came to me and said, here are some documents, did we produce these? And somebody looks at them and says, yes, we produced them. I wouldn't say, let's produce those too. Uh, that was the it, question it, that was being asked, I, have I we think, produced I think the, them? The problem here is that they were from a different source. They went to, uh, through, through uh, uh, Mr. Lindsay's office to the chief counsel's office and uh, they made the determination they were duplicates. I, I think we ought to 
ha see those uh, see all of those documents. So we'll send a, a relevant subpoena up for those as well as the, the zip disk as well. Uh, Mr. Shays. Do you want well, to I, 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 it's my time now. I'll yield to you, Mr. Shea. Do, do, does it Are you finished, uh, Mr. Bart? I don't think he's finished. No, I, I could use some more time if, uh, it. if it's available. Oh, and excuse me, Mr. LaTourette. Are you prepared you to, to, uh, to go for it? If you, if you prefer, if you prefer. <laughs> Mr. Bart. Thank you. The search that, uh, that you were talking about uh, Ms. Nolan, I think you described it as the second search uh, earlier. The search that Mr. Haas did. Is, is that the search you're talking about That's when you a, say the second search? Uh, I'm sure, sorry, you'd have to point me to exactly where I said the second search. I assume that's what I was talking about. Pursu I think it was pursuant uh, to some of your answers to questions by Mr. Waxman. You used the term second search. The, uh, I, you know, and, uh, unless I see exactly where I said it, I, I can't I mean, assure you, but my, my, I mean, uh, best, I mean, you, my best guess, Mr. Barr, is that, yes, I was referring to the search that Mr. Haas did of the server uh, uh, after the Mail 2 problem had been identified. Okay. What was the scope of that search? Uh, I, I don't know exactly, sir. Okay. When was it conducted? Sometime in the summer of 1998, I'm not sure. And this was the one that you say was conducted by Mr. Haas? That's correct, sir. Okay. Uh, Mr. Rabin, uh, last week the uh, Department of Justice indicated, I think, that it was launching a criminal investigation of this matter. Uh, what was it in particular that gave rise to that decision at that particular time last week? I don't, I don't know all of the facts that prompted the campaign finance task force. How about, how about some of them? Share some of them with I, us. I know that there's a, a filing that was submitted in the civil case that reflects some of the concerns that the campaign finance task force um, perceived that prompted them to initiate their inquiry. Is uh, when you, are you talking about Mr. James Gilligan? No, sir. There's a. Who who is uh, James Gilligan? Could you tell us how he fits into the equation? I I believe that he's an attorney in the civil division, but I I don't know. Okay, but he is involved, is he not, with uh, these probes? I'm not sure what you mean by probes. Do you mean the the criminal inquiry that's been initiated? Uh, not only that one, but the. Uh, the various investigations that have been uh, ongoing, uh, both civil and by the independent counsel. I'm not sure exactly what he does. I can find out and get back to you, but I believe that he's a civil division attorney that's been involved in the civil action. Right, and he, he was uh, aware at least as far back as December of 1998 about this problem. Uh, is that correct? I, I have no idea what he was aware of, sir. Okay. Uh, do we have a copy of the, uh, I have a letter here from Judicial Watch dated December 8, 1998, uh, referencing uh, articles from an, uh, an edition of Insight Magazine. Uh, and if we could uh, ask unanimous, if I could ask unanimous consent to have that made a part of the record, please, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, that letter is dated December 8th of 1998 uh, to Mr. Uh, Gilligan at the Civil Division of the Department of Justice. Uh, now, does Mr. Gilligan work with Michelle Peterson? Mr. Gilligan, I believe, is the Department of Justice attorney. I believe, I, I don't think that I know Ms. Peterson, but I think I learned today that she works at the White House. It, it, is, it is a fact that Mr. Gilligan, Gilligan works with Michelle Peterson and Sally Paxton. It, both, they are both at the White House Counsel's Office, are uh, they not? Sally Paxton is not, sir. She was at the White House Counsel's Office. Michelle Peterson is, okay. yes. Okay, and when did Ms. Paxton leave? It was before I got there, sir. I'm not exactly sure. How about approximately? I, I don't know. I could get the answer to you, but I just, I don't know. I mean, you, you, you went there most uh, recently in September in of this year. September of 19, last year rather, September okay. of 1999. Uh, but she had been there uh, in 1998. 
I couldn't testify to that. I just don't know. I, I will try to find out. So maybe Mr. Lindsay's uh, helping us out here. Is he? Is Mr. Lindsay helping us out here? Uh, <laughs> it's fine with Not me. That I, I mean, can I'd, out. Mr. Bruce Lindsay is here. I, would you uh, Would you like to testify, Mr. Lindsay? I, I'm not sure when she left. We can find out. Okay. When do you have it? Do you have a copy of the December eighth, nineteen ninety eight letter there? I believe. Oh, that's that's what I have. Yes. Okay, sir. That's that's what I. I, I haven't read it yet. Uh, it's a fairly short letter from Judicial Watch, and it, uh, it, I don't know if you have the attachments, but there were some attachments there. The point is that at least in December of 1998, Mr. James Gilling was on notice that there was this problem with the emails. Uh, do you need to go to another uh, uh, member? Yes, right the gentleman's now, time has expired, if you like, but we'll, we'll come back and, okay, and cover you. your question. Uh, with the... Uh, I think we're starting our second round. L l let me just go back to the document that uh, I'll take my five minutes now that Mr. Barry signed. Mr. Rabin, Rabin. Rabin. Uh, Rabin. Rabin. I'll get it right. It's, cl it's close to the building. Okay. Uh, Mr. Rabin, do you agree that paragraph four of the affidavit is false? I, d I haven't seen the affidavit. Well, stop I'm, the clock. I, I'll be happy. I mean, I give Mr. Rabin the document. It's GR1. Would somebody give him a copy of the document? It's it's on the table in front of you, I guess. Let's say, oh, tell me it is. I'm sorry. Yes, there is a GR1 here. Okay. Would you look at? Paragraph four of the affidavit. And would you agree since that it's the, Since July 14th, that one? Yes. Would you agree that that's false? I just want to be clear. So this is the declaration that we're talking about? Stop paragraph four? Since July 14th, 1994, email within the EOP, that paragraph? That's it. Mm -hmm. I have no knowledge. I have no ability to determine whether it's true or false. <laughs> you know, I think I've asked you four or five questions, Mr. Rabin, Rabin, and every one of those questions you said you have no knowledge or you can't. What, what are you doing here? Well, you subpoenaed me, sir. I know. I Well, I subpoenaed, well, you... I'll tell you what I'll do. The next time I'll just have to subpoena the whole daggone Justice Department because somebody has the answer up there and you're the man that was supposed to be the one that could answer the questions. I, and you I, have no knowledge. Did you talk to anybody at the Justice Department about the questioning that was going to go on this week? Yes, I did. Did, 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 did you go over any of the documents or any of the information that, that uh, we discussed last week or any of the testimony of last week? I looked through... Uh, some of the public documents that I know to have been disseminated in this case, the trans some of the transcripts. Well, last week we talked to uh, Mr. Barry, and it was a significant part of the discussion. Do you recall us talking to Mr. Barry? Did you review any of those documents that we talked to Mr. Barry about? I did not. You did not. Did you review any of the testimony from last week? I read some of it, yes. You read some of it? Yes. So you came to testify and you hadn't reviewed the, the, the documents or the information. <sighs> Ms. Nolan, did, did Mr. Barry express any hesitation about signing that affidavit? Do you know? I, 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 don't, I don't know, sir. I wasn't there and I, I, I don't know. Well, we've been informed that Barry was told not to worry about it by Justice Department lawyers, but you have no knowledge of that. And I, uh, I have no knowledge of and that. Neither does Mr. Rabin. Mr. Rabin, do you know if uh, Barry expressed any hesitation to Justice Department lawyers that the affidavit that they helped him prepare was accurate, was not accurate? You have no knowledge. No knowledge. Who at the Justice Department would have knowledge? Knowledge of what? Of Mr of this affidavit and whether or not they told Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Big pardon? 
Mr. Barry, that uh, that uh, there was no problem with him signing it. I don't know. I will try to find out for you, sir. I, I presume that we're talking about people within the civil division. Do you know who helped him prepare the affidavit? Do not. You don't know that either? I do not. So you don't know if Mr. Barry was told not to worry about any problems in the affidavit? You don't know that either? No. I have failed to say, and, and should make it clear, I, I presume, but you will not be surprised to hear that I don't know, that many of the facts that you're talking about are now going to be encompassed or, or are encompassed within an initiated criminal inquiry. Within your investigation that you will control at the Justice Department, correct? There will be a Justice Department criminal investigation of many of the facts that have been And usually when we ask for information, asserted. once the Justice Department involves itself in a criminal investigation, they say that's pending before the Justice Department, and a con congressional committee has no jurisdiction until it's been resolved. That's the kind of answer we've been getting time after time. It's before the grand jury at 6C material, and we can't get anything out of the Justice Department. L let me just say, I want to know, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to find out who helped draft that affidavit. I want to know exactly who at the Justice Department helped prepare that affidavit. And Ms. Nolan, I'd like to know at the White House who exactly helped participate in drafting that affidavit. Because I'm going to subpoena those people and have them come before the committee and ask them whether or not they gave him that kind of information that there was no risk in him signing that. Mr. Would, would the chairman yield for a moment? And, I, and, I, and I'd like to find out uh, if you have somebody that's an assistant here, if you can get that information by the end of the hearing. We're going to be here till 5.30 or 6 o'clock probably. So would you instruct your counterparts from the Justice Department and the White House to give us the names of the people who worked on those affidavits? We want to talk to them, okay? Would you do that? Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, would uh, yield for a moment? Uh, my time has expired. Uh, who's next on the list here? Well, Mr. Barr, you're next because Mr. Waxman is not yet here. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, following on uh, uh, your question uh, with regard to the uh, timing of the, the latest so-called uh, criminal probe, uh, the record that you've established, Mr. Chairman, clearly establishes that the White House knew there was a problem with these emails, uh, their retention and retrieval, as early as January, late January, early February of 1998, uh, even if they maintain that somehow they did not know then, uh, clearly by the summer of 1998, they knew there was a serious problem. Uh, we also know that the Justice Department had conversations with Mark Lindsay in 1998. Uh, we also know now uh, that the Justice Department knew directly from the civil proceedings the, uh, the Judicial Watch is handling uh, will give them the benefit of the doubt as late as December of 1998 that there was a serious problem here. Uh, yet the Department of Justice, for reasons professed to be unknown by Department of Justice witnesses today, cannot tell us any reasoning as to why the timing of their so-called criminal, uh, criminal probe didn't occur until last week. Uh, I, in the absence of some explanation as to why they sat on this for month after month after month after month, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm left, unfortunately, with the same conclusion that you have, that the timing of the so-called criminal probe announced last week is simply to thwart uh, the discovery uh, uh, in the civil case or cases uh, as well as uh, this, uh, this committee's uh, legitimate uh, probe. Uh, and I agree with you, Mr. Chairman, that is something that we ought to look into because uh, uh, if, in fact, the system uh, whereby legitimate investigations are used uh, legitimately uh, to limit outside investigations while a legitimate criminal probe is going on in order to protect that information normally within the breast of a, of a, uh, of a grand jury, uh, is being abused simply to deny materials uh, to uh, a plaintiff uh, or and or to uh, deny materials to a congressional investigation, uh, Mr. Chairman, that goes beyond simply incompetence to obstruction of justice uh, and obstruction of Congress. Uh, and that doesn't even get to the obstruction that we went into last week with regard to uh, witnesses uh, testifying uh, under oath 
that they were intimidated into not disclosing uh, evidence that they had about this particular problem. Uh, so I consider uh, uh, the hearing last week and this follow-up hearing, Mr. Chairman, very, very serious. Uh, and uh, again, the position, Ms. Nolan, that, you, that you've taken, uh, that Mr. Ruff either didn't know there was a real problem here or thought it had just gone away or been resolved just, just does not make any sense. Uh, White House lawyers knew there was a problem. The Office of Administration knew there was a problem. The Department of Justice knew there was a problem. It just strains credibility for you to say that, in your view, Mr. Ruff thought this problem had been resolved. It clearly had not been resolved. Uh, and that's, that's what's, uh, what's particularly bothersome uh, to us. Uh, and yet you, you seem to be saying that the problem, uh, as you all saw it, had no effect on uh, the subpoenas uh, until you read about it, I think uh, you said in the in the in the Washington Times uh, in February of this year. Uh, what ha are you having us believe that nobody within the White House communicates with uh, people in the Office of Administration or nobody in the White House Counsel's Office communicates with people at the Department of Justice uh, because each one of the offices knew there was a problem. Mr. Barr, I can't affect what you believe. I can tell you... Yes, you that, can. Uh, sir, I can tell you that it is my testimony, it has been my testimony through several hours here, that Mr. Ruff has informed me that he was uh, aware that there might have been or was a problem with a search, that it turned out there was not a problem with that search because the, the retrieved emails were duplicative, that he was not aware that there was an ongoing problem. I can't speak to what the Department of Justice knew um, or... At what point did Mr. Ruff, in your opinion or your view, yes. realize that there was still a problem? Gentlemen's time has or expired. Or does he not we'll, even realize that now? We'll, we'll let her... We've in. talked to him uh, in the past month, yes, sir. And he realizes there's a problem? He, he realizes now that uh, that the mail to and letter D uh, uh, problems, computer problems, uh, could have affected searches that were conducted. Yes, sir. And, and Mr. Barr, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to you. Mr. Waxman would like to have uh, his five minutes now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to clarify for the record, uh, there's some, been some question about Mr. Haas's testimo testimony. Uh, and this is uh, from the record from last week. This is a Robert Haas that, with regard to the zip disk. Uh, Mr. Burton said, okay, did you ever save any search responses or records on another electronic media such as a zip drive? Question. Mr. Haas, just the stuff I saved for the people with the subpoena right now last week. I've never saved it on a zip drive for anybody. Mr. Burton. Never, never saved it on a zip drive or any kind of electronic device that you might have had at home or something? Mr. Haas, no, sir, I don't have a zip drive. I have a zip drive at home that is currently broke, but I don't have any. I just recently got a zip drive at work to record these documents last week, but I don't, Mr. Burton. The one at home, though, doesn't have any information on it? Mr. Haas, no, sir. So they central point was that uh, when he was asked about it, uh, he said that he had sa the stuff I saved for the people with the subpoena right now last week. Now, I, I want to also make a point for the record about uh, Tony Berry, or Daniel Tony Berry. Uh, the chairman made a perjury allegation regarding his affidavit, which was submitted in July 1999 now, this affidavit was part of a civil suit brought by plaintiffs represented by Larry Clayman of Judicial Watch. Mr. Berry is a career civil servant with expertise in technical computer matters. I understand that the affidavit was filed in response to complaints by Larry Clayman regarding the efforts of the Office of Administration to reconstruct emails, reconstruct emails that existed before the establishment of the Automated Records Management System, or the ARMS, in 1994. This reconstruction effort is separate from reconstruction related to the mail-to-email problem that this committee has recently been examining. 
Mr. Berry's affidavit describes the 1994 reconstruction status uh, should be taken in the proper context. It addressed questions such as the status of the restoration and reconstruction process for pre-July 14, 1994 email. The time and cost associated with conducting the email search proposed by the plaintiffs in the civil lawsuit and the steps involved with such a search. Now, it's true that the affidavit did not disclose the mail to computer glitch that occurred several years later. But given the context of the affidavit, it's hard to see how that omission would be perjury. It appears that the main point of the affidavit was to describe the status of the pre-arms email reconstruction and how searches requested by the plaintiff would be conducted. In hindsight, it would have been a good idea to include information in the affidavit regarding the status of the mail to problem. However, the omission of that information is a far cry from uh, perjury. Then I understand uh, an issue has come up about the, uh, uh, the Armstrong case and what was the requirement placed on the uh, White House. And the, um, in that case, and I, I was able to uh, read this from the case, Whereas federal records are subject to a strict document management regime supervised by the archivist, the P Presidential Records Act accords the president virtually complete control over his records during his term of office. That's from the Armstrong case. Neither the archivist nor an agency head can initiate any action through the attorney general to effect recovery or ensure preservation of presidential records. So um, it would appear that even though the uh, case didn't apply to the presidential records, the White House was still trying to create a system where they would treat the presidential records the same as they would any other uh, federal records. And um, then just on this point about the Justice Department launching an investigation in order to keep a real investigation from taking place. I think we all ought to remember that there's still an independent counsel, Mr. Ray, and he's investigating whether he got all the information to which he was entitled. So even if you accept this theory that justice isn't doing the job, and I don't accept that theory, that's a huge leap, but if you accept that theory, the fact of the matter is there is an independent investigator out there looking to see whether the uh, emails were uh, properly turned over and whether there's information that the independent counsel didn't receive uh, pursuant to his investigation. I see my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. I'll, uh, I'll come back later with uh, another round. <coughs> Mr. Shays. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Nolan, I, I have low expectations. Um, and if I do, I, I don't get frustrated. I mean, I still don't know who hired Craig Livingstone. And, um, um, I'm dealing with a White House that would send a president a, me a memo from Phil Kaplan entitled DNC Finances. And he said, of this two million will be used for campaign, one million for campaign wind down and compliance audit, and one million for potential fines. Uh, so we had a White House that knew they were gonna break the law. I certainly knew a campaign that have to pay fines to do it. So my expectations are pretty low, but I would like to try to get some basic information. And one of them is, I want to identify this document. Um, you make reference to it. Um, we send a letter on March t uh, 21st uh, to James Wilson, the chief counsel. Can you and tell me what document you're referring to, Mr. Yes, it's uh, NG1. Why don't we put it up on the board? And just that first page is good enough. Tell me what this document is. Um, this was sent to us um, by, uh, by the associate counsel to the president, Dimitri uh, Nikakis. Neonakis. Neonakis, thank you. Um, so Mr. Neonakis sent this to us. You make reference to it in your testimony. Tell me what this document is. Um, I, I'm sorry, sir. I don't. I don't remember making reference to it myself, other than in response to a question. But I can uh, turn to turn to the bottom of page six. Page six of my written your testimony. testimony. 
I'd like you to read it. Read all of, of two. Oh, yes, sir. I do remember Would this. Would you now. read it, please? Yeah. Absent a search of backup tapes, we cannot currently estimate how many emails were affected. Late Friday, March 17, Northrop Grumman Council provided OA with a document that appears to reflect that on, Jan on June 18, 1998, an NG employee reviewed the affected arms managed account on the server and counted the number of affected emails on the server at that time. I have been informed that OA and IS&T personnel were previously unaware that this document existed or that anyone had estimated the number of unrecorded emails. Although we cannot attest to the accuracy of this document, we provided it to you yesterday. Now, um, do you have any reason to doubt the accuracy? No, sir. Okay. Um, it says, I have been informed. Um, that OA and IST personnel were previously unaware that this document existed or that anyone had estimated the number of unrecorded records. Um, that same language, I have been informed that OA and IST personnel were previously unaware that this document existed or that anyone had estimated the number of unrecorded emails. We have two different eyes with the same sentence. That's GR6. Now, let's just deal with what, you. I'm sorry, GR6 is? Well, it's just the same sentence. It's just from Neonakis. He said the same thing. That was in his letter of transmittal. Okay, thank so you, So it's interesting. You both use the same sentence, but I is you and I is him. So I want to know who you spoke with. Uh, who informed you? Mr. Neonakis, sir. So Mr. Neonakis <laughs> informed you that OA and IST personnel were previously unaware that this document existed or that anyone had estimated the number of unrecorded emails. That's... Were previously unaware that anyone had... And, and, and who, and, who and told you? Mr. Neonakis, sir. Okay, so Mr. Neonakis says, I have been informed that OA and IST personnel were previously unaware that this document existed or that anyone uh, had estimated the number of unrecorded emails. Would he tell me that you told him that? No, sir, I don't believe he would. Okay, who do, you, who do you think he would tell you? I believe that he spoke with the general counsel of the Office of Administration. Now, this document has a lot of names in it. Uh, why don't you just tell me what it means, that first page? Uh, just well, pick out a name. Let me make clear, this is a document that a Northrop Grum Grumman employee provided. We, it's not something we produce. And you have no interest in this document? Uh, I you, did don't, not, you don't care I did understand. not say that, sir. I, I just said I want to make clear, if I'm going to answer questions about yeah, it, I'm, that it's I'm not clear. something I produced or that uh, uh, I'm going to be yeah. telling you what I know from the document. Fair enough. That's no, it. I think that's fair to point out. I just, my interest is just knowing if you have enough interest to know about this document, because really what the White House has consistently done is it simply chosen not to know information and then they don't have to share information. So I'm interested to know. Mr. Chairman, I'm, my time has run out. I just wonder if my colleague would do it. If the gentleman uh, I'd, I'd be happy to yield to Mr. Shea. Thank you. Mr. Latourette, we yield. Uh, just, let's just take uh, Doreen Weaver. Uh, it has 441, the uh, number 441. I'm sorry, ten. sir, where are you on it? Third name down. Okay, thank you. What does that mean? Uh, what does 441 mean? Yes, ma'am. Um, I believe that the 441 refers to the uh, emails that were not captured by arms. Okay. So now, if I turn to page 304 of that document. Pardon, sir? If I turn to page 304 of that document, I see the name Philip Kaplan, the same one, I believe, who wrote that memo. The, I call it the UG memo because alongside of it is the president's handwritten UG when he learned that they would have to pay, set aside a million dollars for illegal, for potential fines. So if, but turn to this document here. Do you see the name uh, Philip Kaplan at yes, the bottom? Sir. What's the number you see there? Uh, I see 944 and, and 5559. And, and may I make an assumption that that's potentially 944 emails that he sent the White House that, that we haven't yet seen? Um, 
again, I, I, you know, I'm not the creator of this, this document. I'm not the best person to answer these questions. No, no, you are a wonderful but person. But I no, think no, that the assumption is wrong because, no, no. sir, yeah. it, uh, my understanding is that the 944 reflects emails that came into him, not emails that he created. Emails that came in, correct. From outside the complex. Okay, right. So I'm, I, we got some emails. We just didn't get these emails. Correct? We don't know if we got these emails or not. Right, and you probably don't care to ever find out. Sir, yeah. we have hired a contractor to restore the backup tapes and make them searchable so that we can do that. I certainly do okay. care that we let me, find out. Let me out. ask you, why should I feel moved by what you said when we had Insight Magazine that a, a year ago talked about this, and then we had Washington Times that had a story, but this time, unlike Insight, they have a name, Cheryl Hall, she broke the story, and then you people tell us the problem. You didn't come first. We had to read about it in the newspaper, didn't we? Sir, that that's true? when I learned of the problem. Yeah, but isn't it a true? No, isn't it I, true I don't that, understand what you're saying Isn't it true, true that this was a problem that existed for a long period of time? You all, the White House knew for a fairly extensive period of time. We have testimony, I believe, uh, from last week that two personnel from the White House were told of this document. You don't have a document? Okay. okay. The question I have is that the first time we learned about it was through a newspaper story. And it's your story that the first time you learned about it was through the newspaper? It is my testimony that the first time I learned of it was uh, with respect to the uh, litigation. I don't know if when, it was When was the, the first time that John Podesta learned of it? Uh, as I testified earlier, John Podesta... June 19th, uh, 1998. That's he when learned he learned of, of some it. problems, sir. I don't know if... I can tell you this. In the past month, my understanding of the problem has, has what, grown what, quite is, a bit. What is the date on the front page of this document? This document was provided to us less than two weeks ago, sir. Less than what, two what, is weeks the, ago. what is the date of it? Uh, on the top of it. I don't see a date. Oh, um, six eighteen ninety-eight. Right now, I had made reference to you of two hundred forty-six thousand emails, and you said, "Well, you didn't know how many." Why wouldn't you have counted these up, sir? This reflects the the count that was done by a Northrop Grumman employee on a particular day. I there are 3,400 backup tapes. They're gonna be, there may well be emails on those that aren't reflected here. I understand, but I'm just curious why you wouldn't have wanted to know how many we were talking about. Were we talking about 50? Or were we talking about a, a few thousand? Why don't you have any curiosity to find out these answers? I would have wanted to know if I were you. I would have wanted to know how big the potential universe is. Mr. Shays, I want to know, too. That's why we have a contractor to look at those 3,400 or more backup tapes and find out. That's the way we'll know. Okay, this document includes 247, give or take, 46,000 potential emails. Correct? I don't know that, sir. Because you didn't count them. Their numbers are right here. You, you haven't asked anyone to just add them up? I have not added them up, sir. You didn't ask anyone else to? I did not ask anyone to add How them How come? Up. Sir, I thought, you know, my, what I wanted to do is see that we get those backup tapes restored and searched, and that's what I'm doing. If you want to count emails on a particular day, no, I you just can wanna, do that, but that is not going to answer the question. Bruce Lindsay, 17. Uh, excuse me, I have, I have the next round, and I'll yield to my colleague. Thank you very much. I mean, just going through it, my curiosity, I, Mr. I guess... Mr. Chairman, can I make, can I answer two uh, questions? If, if the gentleman would yield, I understand that the, the witnesses need to take a quick break, uh, and uh, if that uh, be the case... Uh, we'll, Let's do that, and then we'll... We'll, we'll allow them, uh, if we could, you know, five to ten minutes for that, and, the, and then whatever questions you have of the chair, we'll answer when you come back. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am.
Mr. Lanterette, we're going to get to you real quick. You know what? I'm anxious. Okay. The committee will uh, reconvene. Mr. Shays, uh, you have uh, my time. Thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, can I make the... Yes, uh, just hold it just a second. Yes, ma'am. Um, you had asked, um, uh, or, or the committee had asked two questions. I said I would try to get back to you today. Yes, uh -huh. Do you have the answer? Uh, Sally Paxton left the White House on January 4, 1999. Okay. Um, and um, Michelle Peterson was the counsel's office uh, lawyer working on the case uh, at the time that the Barry affidavit was done. So she worked? I, she, she worked on the case. I don't know yet whether she worked on the affidavit. Um, you, you haven't but been she able to the, find out if anybody else? She was the else? counsel's office uh, lawyer who was responsible for that case. Well, the thing is, so if it, if it was somebody in the counsel's office, it would have been Michelle Peterson. Okay, the reason I, I, I'd like to have a definitive answer from both of you today is because uh, we're going to have more hearings, but I want to minimize those. And if we bring more people in, they say, well, it wasn't me, it was somebody else, then we have to go through this again and again. I mean, we're going to be consistent and we're going to follow through to get as many of these answers as possible. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Ray Ben. Have you found out anything no, yet? No, I sent a gentleman a check and I'm waiting on an answer, sir. Okay, well, you'll inform us as soon as you're ready. Mr. Shays. Yes, could you put uh, WH2 on? Thank you. Um, Ms. Nolan, uh, you may have misspoke, uh, and I don't want to try to trap you into misspeaking. You said the first time you learned about the problem was reading it in the newspaper on March, on February 15th? Is that your testimony? No, sir. You said that, sir. I don't believe I said that. Okay. I I said that um, the first time I learned about the scope of the problem was following the uh, uh, filing in the case. I was I that? was briefed in in February. I'm not sure. Weren't you of briefed the exact in January? Date. I was briefed in January, uh, as I testified this morning, um, about a, uh, a post president's uh, presidency transition. Um, you were briefed briefing. that there was a problem with uh, the mail two issue. You I was briefed on the mail two and letter D problem, so, but not, And sir, so we found out after the story, you found out before the story. I did not find out the scope or nature of the problem, no, sir. So, so pardon me? Well, you, you, you said there were, the scope is 526 total users affected. That's a pretty large scope. Earlier, sir, you thought that the scope was how many emails that, were affected. No, but that's the users. So your non-inquisitive mind is really uh, demonstrated here. I mean, did you figure that nobody... the first person who's accused me of that, sir. Well, I'm accusing you of it. I, I hear it. I and, hear the accusation, yeah, sir. And the accusation is very clear. Um, you were given a document, ultimately, that had thousands, hundreds of thousands of names. Let's just go through some of these names. I would think you would have wanted to go through it. Philip Kaplan, who wrote the UG memo, uh, he had 944. Um, Bruce Lindsay, 17. Betty Curry, 811. Boy, I'd love to see some of these e emails. I, I am I'm informed, not sir, I'm that not these finished. emails are... I'm not are... finished. Erskine Bowles, 161. Ira Magaziner, 3,693. Bill Clinton, two. Now, see, the, the reason I'm speaking this way is it only, you know, that one memo from Mr. Kaplan, I'm sure people didn't want us to get when they acknowledged that they knew they were going to break the law and be fined a million dollars, potentially. So, you know, even one out of 200 and 246,000 might be very interesting for us to see, might be pertinent to all these investigations. What did you want to say? Mr. Shays, I wanted to say, first of all, memos by Mr. Kaplan would have been captured because it's only email coming into the system uh, that was uh, affected by the mail to and letter D that, problem. Is it your Secondly, testimony? Is it your testimony that um, he never sent ma emails from outside the White House to the White House? To, I, I, I send emails back and forth from outside and inside. I mean, clearly you're not saying that to us. It's not my testimony. I have no idea what his practice was. So do you was. want to withdraw your, your, the statement you just made, implying that... that I, I would like not to withdraw it, sir, but uh, I'm certainly happy to be more specific. 
email written by Mr. Kaplan uh, in the EOP would have been captured by an armed search, as I understand the armed system. The second thing I would like to say... If he sent them outside, they wouldn't be captured, No, right? sir, they would. It's, all, only all you, it's only email that came into the complex. That's exactly no, no, what no, I mean about how difficult sec, it is to I understand he, this problem. If he sent them from outside to in... If he sent them from outside to in during the relevant periods, they would not have been captured right. by arms. Unless, but they may have been left on the server, they may have been captured because they were forwarded um, or because they were replied to uh, with history. The other thing I wanted to say about these numbers um, is that I understand that the numbers refer to how many incoming emails there were on somebody's server, not necessarily how many incoming emails had not been captured by arms. So your point is that the number is going to be less, and I agree with that. I mean, you may find that this number of 246 uh, will be redu reduced because you have emails found in individual PCs. You may find it's in reduced because you have emails find attached to sent emails with history. You may find it reduced because emails found in printed files. You may find it reduced because emails um, retrieved from backup tapes. All of that may be true, but given the extraordinary number of emails, there are probably going to be thousands and thousands and thousands that aren't. Uh, Mr. Mr. Shays, uh, we'll get back to you. Uh, we are now going to the long-suffering Mr. La Tourette. May, may I may I make something clear, uh, sir? Sure. Um, the left column, as I understand it, is total email, and the column under the name on the record we're looking at, as I understand it, is unrecorded email. Uh, before before we go to Mr. Lotterat, I just want to clarify one point that you made. You said that uh, a contract had been signed and that it was going to take approximately six months and that they were going to be uh, going through these emails in batches, starting with the most current and going backwards. Is that correct? Uh, the timing of what emails they'll go through or what backup tapes uh, has not been determined yet, sir. Um, it is correct that a contract was signed this week and that well, who we, will make that determination? Uh, uh, we will the council's office will work with the various investigative bodies and the office of administration who's administering the contract The first thing they have to do is get the backup tapes on a system as I understand it and figure out uh, What dates they they reflect and um, that kind of thing. We just don't have that information yet. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll need to talk to you about that later. Mr. Yes, Lottaret. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, Ms. Nolan, uh, did you, I was out of the room after the votes. Did you uh, find the information to Mr. Waxman's question, that is how many emails from the office of the vice president have been turned over? I haven't gotten that answer oh, yet, Mr. Okay. Lottaret. But when you do do that, could I just add a, a couple of additional requests? And that is in that, uh, uh, sort if you can tell us how many were from the vice president himself, Mr. Gore, and then two, if you could supply to the committee in writing the names of the three email users uh, who uh, who have accounts created after 1997, but who were not being captured by the arms system from the office of the vice president. If you could supply that to the committee, I'd appreciate it. Um, here, uh, as I've been listening, I, I think that the problem that I continue to have, and I think some of my colleagues continue to have, is that over this uh, assertion that when Mr. Haas does this manual search that everything that he finds is duplicative. And, and here's why I, I have trouble with it. The, the reason that this problem became, uh, uh, people became aware of it at all was Mr. Barry finds two, one side of a conversation that Monica Lewinsky is having with someone in the White House. And so not within the White House complex is this, this missing email, that is the one that, that's come in. That's how this problem came about. So for someone then to go onto the server and uh, say that you, you dredged up, you know, with the, the name Lewinsky or, or Betty Curry or whatever, you dredged up this entire body of information, I don't think that that, that can't be right because the, the problem is that the stuff that was coming in isn't there anymore. And, and the reason is, uh, just to go one step further, when we were talking to Mr. Haas, he, he said that when the White House got a document request, they would ask people, for instance, if, if there was something relative to your computer, you'd get, could you please check your hard drive and see what, 
what's located there. But if you deleted it before the end of the business day when the, when the server kicks in to, to run the backup tape, it's gone. I mean, it, it's, it's nowhere, if, unless it's been captured by arms and these things weren't captured by arms. So they're, they're just gone. And, and that's, the, that's the difficulty that I think that we're having when you say uh, that it's duplicative. And I, I just want to turn your attention to... Uh, uh, Mr. Latourette, can yeah. I, may I just mention that sure. it, it is gone unless, as I said, it was forwarded or replied to with history or that kind of thing. Yeah, but, but, but uh, again, I, I, I'm sort of computer stupid, but I know that at the end of every day when I shut down my, my Microsoft Exchange or whatever it is, it deletes everything in my, my deleted site. They're gone. I mean, and, and then my server in my office backs things up at 5 o'clock every night. And so anything that I've deleted from my computer during the course of the day isn't backed up anywhere. It's gone. Uh, you're right, unless I've maintained it or forwarded it or done something else. So, so, but, but to suggest that that happened to all of them, uh, I, I think is not, is not uh, it doesn't comport with what the reality of the user systems is. If you could look at uh, an exhibit that we've marked, uh, WH3. Uh, if you, WH3, sure. <coughs> Okay. I have it. All right. Do you know who the, what, who the author of that document is, WH3? Uh, they were drafted by uh, Dimitri Neonakis, an associate counsel. All right. And, and specifically, if I could turn your attention to uh, beginning in, in something on page two called The Effect on Searches to Respond to Subpoena Requests. Um, about the, old, the second question under that, uh, but you didn't search these emails. You haven't really complied with all the subpoena requests. The answer is that isn't really accurate. When we search for responsive materials in addition to the ARM search, all individual users are told to search their own computer records. So a search should have, been, should have covered everything on the server at that time, including any undeleted incoming emails, which is what we've been talking about, any undeleted yes, incoming emails. And then the next question is, what if they were deleted before the search of the server? And then the answer is, then it would be the same as someone tossing out a piece of paper that they didn't need anymore. Uh, and did you search the server to see if they were still there? And then this, this question is the one I want to answer is, as we've told congressional committees and independent counsel, the server can only be searched manually, and we don't have the time or the funds to perform manual searches for every subpoena request. And, and that was, this document was prepared for what, the White House Counsel's Office? Uh, it was prepared um, uh, as uh, talking points, I believe, for um, press discussions. It only stayed in draft. We didn't use it. So we never uh, finished it. But, but the fact of the matter is, in, in response to subpoenas or requests, be it from a, a court or, or a congressional committee, as I understood it, a memo would go out and say, hey, we've gotten a subpoena, please search your hard drives, and people would look at their hard drives, but if they weren't there, we wouldn't find them. But there was no obligation then, nor was there anything done to search the servers because of the time and expense. Yeah, it seemed like there was some confusion about that, and I, I'd like to try to clarify it if I can. Sure. Though I'm not sure my computer expertise is any different from the one you said you have. Right. Um, when a EOP user turns on his or her computer, th their email accounts, there's word processing accounts, um, the email accounts your, my email, when I open my, my computer and turn it on and go to my email, all that email actually resides on the server. It doesn't reside in my hard disk on my PC. But if, if I'm uh, told to search my email, I go to my email account and search that email. It, it physically resides on the server, but to me and to any average normal person, I think it looks like that's the email on my computer. Right. So there's a technical difference between what's on your PC and what's on your server, but not a real life difference to people who are doing the searches of their own computers. But, but, but if I could just ask one more question, Mr. Chairman, I mean, th this, this is the point. I, I think you're exactly right, and, and you do appear to have as much knowledge as I do about computers, but th that stuff is on the server. It's not, it's not on your computer after you've gotten rid of it. In other words, if you sent me an email, I open it, I write back to you, but then I delete that, that string, that correspondence. It, it may be on your server and my server, or mine if you've sent the email, uh, but it's no longer on my computer, and there's no way that I can retrieve that from my computer. When I, when, if I delete an email, I am deleting it from the server as well as from my computer. There's no difference. Uh, unless, okay, uh, unless, I would say this, unless, 
uh, you left it at the end of the business day, the system backs up. Then it's on a backup tape, sir, but it would not be on the server anymore. Okay. I, my time's up, and I'll come back later. Okay. Mr. Barr. I'd like to yield uh, time to the gentleman from, uh, where is it, somewhere in the Midwest, Ohio? It's, it's Ohio, Mr. Barr. It's, <laughs> it's right on top of Georgia, almost. <laughs> I, uh, and I thank the gentleman for yielding. I, um, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about something we were talking to Mr. Mark Lindsay about when he was here last week, and that is, uh, he talked about a prioritization list. In other words, he, although what was the matter with this system didn't apparently come to Mr. Ruff's attention, according to what he's told you, uh, Mr. Mark Lindsay had a very good understanding of, of that this was a two-part problem. One is, and they call it stopping the bleeding, that is, the, the, the make sure that all incoming email was captured by the ARM system, and that's what cost $600,000, and they worked real hard on it, and some people said they called it Project X after the X files and all that other business. But the, the second part was the reconstruction of all of the stuff that hadn't been captured in over two years. Uh, and, and Mark Lindsay understood that, uh, and he indicated that he had a series of meetings with people, and uh, this was sort of like on one of those honey-do lists that, okay, we have to do this with our computers, we have to reconstruct the emails that we didn't do to, to put them into the ARM system, we have to do that. And, and I, th I think he used the word mission critical. He, he said that there was a list established that identified mission critical things that needed to be done. Uh, one thing that he recalled was he, he there's a, a cabinet meeting apparently and the vice president said, you know what, uh, there's going to be a poster child for Y2K noncompliance, and I'm going to tell you right now, it's not going to be the White House, and so you guys get your, your act together and make sure that we're all squared away. And so Mr. Lindsay spent a lot of time getting Y2K compliant. He did a lot of other things, but he told us last week that he knew that this was a problem, but he didn't do anything to reconstruct this mail to server problem because it wasn't mission critical. Uh, do you have any knowledge of that whatsoever? Um. I have knowledge of something around that, Mr. Lautrec. Why don't you tell us what you know? That um, it, it is my understanding that the Office of Administration made a determination that it would first uh, do uh, all the necessary Y2 compl Y2K compliance um, and then begin the reconstruction of the email. It's my understanding that they thought of it as a uh, historical matter, a presidential records historical matter, uh, and federal records, and they were really thinking of the federal records, I think, um, and um, that uh, uh, the Office of Administration, therefore, um, did not um, see this as something that had to be done immediately. Right. Uh, knowing what we know today, as we all sit here in the knowledge that you've gained, that probably wasn't the smartest decision in the world. Um, in terms of it, it was something that needed to be done to adequately respond to subpoenas and other requests for documents from the White House, didn't it? I mean, I, we're not unclear on that. Uh, I think there was a disconnect between those who were doing the searching for subpoenas and those who were handling the computer issues. Yes, sir. I, I think that's right. And, and one of the things that came up in the hearing that I, I it, it's not comical because it's, it's again, there was a lot going on with this administration in terms of people wanted documents and were entitled to documents relative to, to, to investigations, legitimate investigations. And one of the things that uh, there's a document that I think it's labeled uh, NG-19, that at the time that people were being told that this wasn't mission critical and we were going to do other stuff, uh, Northrop Grumman was directed to get the, the White House Christmas card list in order. Uh, rather than reconstruct the problem with the mail to server. It, it, that's right, right? I'm sorry, sir, I hadn't seen that document before. Okay, well, let me, maybe if the, if the fellow that's helping you can get out NG-19. Yes. And if we can go to, it's a multi-page document, and I think I'd like you to go to page four. Um, and that indicates that the Lotus Note, Note team continued the development of the holiday card application. Uh, and they made a couple of presentations on August the 24th. Uh, they developed it to EOP management. And who is EOP? Who's the executive office of the president's management team that the holiday card package would have been presented to? Uh, the management of the executive office of the president is the office of administration. I don't know what team. Okay. And, 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 and then on August the 26th, they made a second presentation of, of how, you know, swift these Christmas cards were going to be to Ada Posey, who was the director of the office administration. Is that right? 
according, oh, that's at what least it according says to here. NG19. That's what it says there. Yeah. Did you have any knowledge as to, to how much money uh, the Christmas card package cost the White House to, uh, to get that up to speed, uh, but we couldn't reconstruct the missing emails? Do, do you have any idea what I, I don't know anything was? about that. Is, is that something you could find out for us and, and perhaps uh, get back to us about? And, and, and at the same time, I mean, I, th I think sadly the president has been quoted in the press saying that, you know, the, if, boy, this is going to cost a lot of money to do this, and that people knew how much time and money. And I, I just find it to be a little odd that we're being told that there wasn't enough money, there wasn't enough time. Some people didn't even know there was a problem, but apparently we did have time uh, to make sure that our Christmas cards got out uh, in that particular year rather than responding to subpoenas from relevant courts of jurisdiction and no less than three committees of the United States Congress. And I thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the next gentleman that we're going to hear from is Mr. Horn. But before we, we go to Mr. Horn, I want to clarify one thing uh, regarding Mr. LaTourette's questioning. You said they thought of it as historical. Who is they? The Office of Administration, sir. The Office of Administration? What was the name of the person? Sir, I, I think we were talking about um, Mr. Lindsay. What, what I meant was that they thought he was thinking of the reconstruction uh, issue as one that had to be done for historical purposes. But not of an immediate nature or anything like that. Um, I, I believe, sir, this is where the, the disconnect or miscommunication see, was that he, uh, he believed that the council's office understood the nature of the problem and was handling anything with subpoenas. The council's office did not. I think that's what happened, sir. Well, Mr. Lindsay and Ms. Crabtree, according to the people from Northrop Grumman, uh, were very concerned. Uh, uh, the people from Northrop Grumman said that they felt like they were in, in jeopardy of their jobs and some even jail if they said anything even to their spouses, some of them said. And so for, for, for you to say that they only thought of it as his, historical really kind of boggles my mind. Because I, I'm those sorry, people sir. I, I, wasn't, I, I wasn't talking about the entire problem. I was talking about doing the reconstruction, when the reconstruction needed to be done by. Mr. Horn. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me ask you a series of questions that maybe can clarify in some of our minds the, the problem of the server and the email and the complexity of it. As I understand it, the White House email users delete their own email, don't they? When they're tired of it? Or yes, they, they can delete their own email, they sir. They can delete it. And uh, that doesn't go through a server, does it? Uh, it resides on the server until they delete it. Okay, but they have the control of bringing that message back and getting rid of it. They have the control of deleting it. They don't, once it's deleted, they don't have control of getting it back. No, sir. Uh, in fact, uh, they're encouraged because of the computer space restraints. Isn't that it? The old problem of not enough memory? Yes, I think, uh, I think that's right. Not to, not to retain too much email on the server. So when individual computer users search their computers in response to a subpoena, they aren't necessarily going to find all the responsive emails on either the computer or the server. The, they, where where right. are they? If, let's assume something was there. Where is it likely to be found, on the server or on that computer? Uh, sir, th they're the same thing for purposes of an EOP user. Um, the user turns on his or her computer to get to your email. All you're really seeing is what's on the server, your account on the server. So what you see on your computer, unless you actually save it to, hard, uh, to the hard drive, uh, what you see on your computer is what's on the server. Are there other areas that they can park messages besides that server that relates to? You could save it to a hard, the, the hard drive, as I understand it, sir. Okay, the hard drive that's related to that computer directly. That, that computer. Okay. All right, but are there other places in the White House where they can put some of these messages, say they didn't want to delete them because they might uh, use them sometime and want them, 
and yet they could delete some from the server, let's say, is there another server around? Is there another system around where they can plant that message? What's your experience? Um, uh, I don't think so, sir. I'm not sure I understand the question, but if well, I do... Question is, question is very simple. If, if I do, you could print out the email, you could save it in paper file. The ARM system, when it operates, as we understood it to operate, would have uh, captured it and it would always stay in the ARM system. But if the ARM system isn't working, then other than uh, sending it electronically somewhere else, just forwarding it or printing it out, I'm not aware of any other place to keep it. Well, a lot of people would do, as you say, a printout because they might want to say this is there and it's under my nose and my desk and this kind of thing. To your knowledge, when the request for the subpoenas came in and they, we needed some of that and other investigations needed some of that by either key word name or whatever or a date period when something happened, and we're talking here really back certainly to 96, 90, uh, eight, and when you go into Waco, it gets back to 1993, but it might have been something said between 96 and 98. So how did the council's office deal with that? Did they say, look, here are some of the key words and let's uh, print them out if they're on your disk? How did it work with most people? The uh, council's office would send a directive um, to the affected uh, entities in the EOP complex uh, directing that um, uh, uh, people search their files, whether in paper form, computer form, or any other form. And then in addition, so each individual would be responsible for looking for those uh, requests, and we would um, generally just indicate what it is that the subpoena has requested, what what the document request is. And then in addition, a White House lawyer would work with uh, IS&T to develop a keyword search to search electronically on the ARM system. Now, did that happen for what period where you say ran a tape and then you search the tape with a keyword index? Um, there, uh, as far as I know, there was no searching of tapes. The, uh, the ARM system is an online um, retrieval system, um, and so that would be searched, and people would look at their individual paper files or computer files. I would think that uh, one of the problems here is that uh, the council's office or the Office of Administration working with the council, because they would know how the computer system works, that they would uh, be able to lay out a pattern as to how you get that information. And I would think they would say to everybody, if you're on the system and you're involved with this name or that name, uh, print it out. And uh, they didn't do that, did they? Um, it, when, there, when there was a uh, document request, people were directed to search their uh, for computer records, if they found them, they would print them out and provide them to the council's office for production. Yes, now, sir. Did the council send them back and say this isn't what uh, is subpoenable, or what did the what was the council's role in all this? Uh, the council's office then looks through material to determine if it's responsive to the subpoena, and either produces or notifies the committee um, if there are privilege questions. Um, of uh, what records it has. But when, when people do searches, they often come up with things that would have the right keyword or the right name but aren't related at all to the subpoena request, especially when you get into some of the broader ones. Um, and so the council's office role is to determine if documents are responsive. Yeah, it's sort of uh, comes to mind that seems to me the council is the point of where they can take evidence and just get rid of it because they've got the print. They say, oh, well, that isn't what they want. Bang, goodbye to it. So did they send it back to some of the people with the servers and the computers? So, uh, and who was to take it off the particular drums, if you will, for want of another word? Who would take that message off the server when they've done the printout and 
what was the pressure to sort of get sudden memory by uh, sort of moving in on the disk and uh, getting more space, and with it goes a lot of messages. How much did that occur? Any occurrence of that that you know of? Did people just get a big laugh out of it? Mr. Horn, I am not aware of anything that would suggest that the council's office gets rid of documents. It produces thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Um, it is true that the EOP, like as far as I'm aware, any organization I've ever been a part of routinely encourages people uh, when server space gets low to delete unnecessary email, to save email that they still need. Um, but that's, that's routine. Uh, there's nothing the least bit nefarious about that, sir. That happens in every organization. Does that happen on a six-month uh, routing there where they say... Uh, you know, I'm, up the thing? Uh, I've been there, I think, uh, almost seven months. I don't know if we've gotten such a notice in the time I've been there. I could check and see when the last one was. Well, do you know Ms. from 96 up, did they do that or did they increase the amount that they wanted wiped off the computer or the server? Um, I, I, it, it did happen at some period, but I don't know how often, sir. I just don't know. Can you sort of find out and let I, us see some of those memos that say, for the sake of more memory, you, we'd like you to get rid of messages yes. you don't need to have there? I, I know we have um, produced uh, samples of those. I'll try to make sure that we have all of them, sir. Gen gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Shays? Ms. Nolan, um, I want to just clarify a, a little bit better uh, why you didn't come and tell this committee when you had a briefing in January about the problem. What did you learn from the Washington Times story of February 15th? What did you learn about then that you didn't know before? It seems to me the only thing you really learned was that there was someone who had gone public. What did you learn? Uh, uh, sir, what I learned when the filing was made in the case uh, was that there might, that there was, I then learned from OA staff that there was a continuing um, uh, situation in which incoming email was still not on our let's, let's forget the continuing. The bottom line was there was still emails that may be pertinent to some independent counsel, special counsel, investigative committee. Uh, you knew that before. So that no, would sir, be I did not. You did not know what? I did not know that there were emails that would have been pertinent that had not been produced or could not be produced. Well, it is your testimony before this committee that um, that this problem of of a mail to configuration that when you were briefed that there were it was in that briefing you were told there were no outstanding emails that hadn't been forwarded to the committee i, I was briefed it's a stretch I, I was briefed sir about uh, um an issue that they were going to do reconstruction for the presidential or the federal records act i did not understand at the time it was a very um, Can you understand? I, uh, I don't understand why you wouldn't understand. The bottom line was there was this bottomless pit of emails that uh, simply weren't being recovered. I was not told that there was a bottomless pit of emails not that like weren't that. being recovered. So let's just say some emails. I was told that there had been a problem. They were reconstructing or going to Re reconstruct. Reconstruct means for reconstruct means that they needed to capture these emails that were still outstanding. Why wouldn't the committee have been told that you were trying I did to not reconstruct that, sir. so you could find the emails? I don't get it. I understand you don't get it. I don't know how to say this a different way because or to say it uninterrupted, but. What I, have, what I have said, and it is my testimony, that I was given a briefing. It was in a meeting for a post-presidency transition issue. It was very brief, and it was that there was a problem. They, were t they did discuss reconstruction. I did not I understand, understand what reconstruction sir, means. What does reconstruction I can't, mean? I just want to know what reconstruction means. You mentioned can I be permitted to finish what I'm saying first, sir? Sure. But then tell me what reconstruction means. 
I will finish what I'm saying and then I will answer your question, sir, but I don't find that I can answer your question. Um, ask me another question. I, I feel like I'm not able to tell you what I know. You obviously choose not to believe me. I can only testify what and happened and what story. I know. Don't, don't lecture me, just tell your story. What's your story? Sir, this is my testimony. What is your testimony? My testimony is that I was given a briefing by uh, several people from the Office of Administration on January 19th, I believe is the date. It was regarding a number of post-presidency transition issues. At that time, they informed me about a mail to and letter D anomaly or problem, I believe is what they called it. I believe I was told that they were reconstructing and my understanding of reconstructing was that they had uh, tapes somewhere that they were gonna put on a different system. I did not understand at that time, and uh, I um, am confident that other people in that meeting did not understand at that time that there had been or was an ongoing problem with regard to armed searches for subpoenas. It seems very clear now that those were the same problems. It was not clear to me in that very brief meeting on January 19th that that was the case. But reconstruct sounds like they got a problem. It means something to the effect that they don't have certain emails and they've got to reconstruct them. All right, so your testimony that you did not realize that there were emails that were not being made available? Is that your testimony? Mr. Shays, that's what I've testified, yes, sir. Okay, so now tell me they what were, you learned they were, afterwards. They were telling me about a federal records issue, about Armstrong compliance, which I've, as I've testified, is not, uh, does not, Armstrong itself does not apply to the White House and, and presidential records. I did not understand this to be a problem affecting White House searches of documents. And, and your testimony is that everyone else in the committee and that briefing had the same impression you had? No, sir, I think the people who did the briefing um, from the Office of Administration understood. So the White, and is, is the Office of Administration the White House? It's part of the Executive Office of the President, sir, I, I yes. mean, I'm being a little facetious. So the White House knew, correct? Sir, uh, you asked me what I knew. Okay. That's what I can testify to. And it's not, it is my understanding that I and no, no one else in I'm the sorry. council's office who were responsible for producing documents knew. And so you, the, the, the you are gentleman, testifying. The gentleman's just time has expired, and I, and I will yield uh, my, my time or part of my time to the gentleman. Just, just, uh, you are testifying that people in the White House knew. It, you just didn't know. People in the executive office of the president, sir, no, knew. I don't know that anyone in the White do, House do, do, office do, do, knew. The executive office of the president, I, I make that as an assumption that that's part of the White House. I mean, you're not in the White House building. The White House is part of the executive office of the president. Right. It's a subunit. So are, are we going to get in a semantics argument that, um, that the White House didn't know because it was just the administrative part of the White House? Sir, you asked me who I knew knew. I'm telling you, you can characterize that as the White House. I am telling you that the White House Counsel's Office, and as far as I know, knew one, no one in the White House office knew. People in the Office of Administration and the technical people clearly did know. That's the disconnect I've testified to. Okay, and I just will make this last question. It is your testimony that the people in the Office of Administration knew, but that no one in the Counsel's Office knew. And therefore, because you all didn't know, you had no obligation, uh, the White House had no obligation to notify uh, the various committees that there were documents that they said had been given uh, that hadn't been given. It's my testimony, sir, that the people producing documents did not know that there was a problem. And I believe, but I don't know, you had the people from the Office of Administration here last week that they did not understand that the council's office and the people producing documents did not know. Since I'm on the chairman's time, I want to yield back, but just let me ask you this. The people who are producing documents, define to me who they uh, are. People in the council's office, sir. Okay. Yeah. 
Why, uh, why did you say the people producing the documents instead of just saying the counsel's office? I had said that before, sir. I wasn't sure that you had accepted that as a description, so I was trying to give another. Okay, thank you very much. I'll just take a, a few minutes here. I, you know, I think with all of the discussion, people lose track of where we are. We had a hearing last week. Five people from Northrop Grumman said that they felt intimidated when they started talking to Ms. Crabtree and Mr. Lindsay about the problem with the missing emails. Three of them said they thought they might even be threatened with jail. One of them in, in very directly felt that, and another said she'd rather, you know, be insubordinate than go to jail. So there was a definite fear. Mr. Lindsay took this information to Mr. Podesta. They wrote a memo. Mr. Podesta explained the situation to Mr. Ruff, I believe, with Mr. Lindsay. Was that, was that not correct? There was, there was apparently a meeting. And it just seems inconceivable that the chief counsel to the president would not know the severity of the problem. It just doesn't, it boggles my mind that he wouldn't know. Now, when Mr. Ruff left, and, and we're going to have Mr. Ruff before the committee, I'm, I feel confident because you can't recall, I mean, he evidently hasn't given you all the information. But it seems to me that when Mr. Ruff left office, uh, he would have passed on to his his uh, a counterpart who was taking over, you Ms. Nolan, uh, some of the problems that the chief counsel's office had to deal with. And it seems like he would have given you a fairly comprehensive uh, uh, analysis of, of this problem with the emails. And yet when we talk to you today, it, it feels like I feel like he really didn't know all that much about it. You had a cursory knowledge. Is that correct? Sir, I had no knowledge until the January 19th briefing. So Mr. Ruff never even talked to you about it? Mr. Ruff, as I've testified, I don't believe understood that there was a problem. That I, well, think, I think he would have told me. Had he realized there was such a problem, I am confident Mr. Ruff unless, would have told me. Unless perhaps he thought that the problem was not going to raise itself. You know, the thing is, Mr. Lindsay knew there was a problem. Ms. Crabtree knew there was a problem, very serious problem. The people from Northrop Grumman knew there was a problem because they felt threatened. Mr. Lindsay talked to Mr. Podesta and we believed with Mr. Ruff, I cannot believe. You know, he, Mr. Lindsay said he didn't remember the phone conversation and yet two days later, he participated in writing a very comprehensive letter to Mr. Podesta, a memo, going into all the details. I just can't believe that, you know, there's this big disconnect over something that's as significant as hundreds of thousands of emails, especially in view of the fact that a whole host of committees, independent councils, and even the Justice Department had subpoenaed all of the documents pertaining to a whole host of different investigations. And, and for all everybody just to say, oh man, we didn't know, and we didn't think it was that severe, and uh, the chief counsel of the president, who's supposed to be watching out for him and advising him on legal matters, wouldn't wouldn't be well aware of this. It just It just... It doesn't wash. There's something there that's not washing. And I guess that's the problem that I feel. And uh, I see my time's expired. Mr. Barr. Uh, Ms. Nolan, let me uh, try and get very specific here, if you would, with me, please. On what day did you realize that you were going to have to do something to make uh, sure that in responding to subpoenas from the Congress, uh, information had not been withheld? Um, I, I don't know what day it was, Mr. Barr. What I know is that at some point last month, I realized that uh, document productions that the council's office had done uh, would have included searches of arms in which incoming email could not have been searched and that we would need to review what document productions we did and figure out what we were going to do and could do about it. But it was not until last month? In February, sir. Okay, after the newspaper articles came out? or After the filing was therewith. made, yes, sir. After what? The filing was made in the case, sir, yes. It's in the, uh, uh, the civil case? That's right. Okay. Uh, are, you, are you familiar, uh, 
familiar with uh, the various civil cases that have been filed against uh, the, the White House or the executive office, whatever, uh, by Judicial Watch, including my case against uh, the administration? I'm aware there is a, a, a case, sir, the, uh, your case, and I'm aware there are other cases. I don't know that I could list all of them. One of, one of the theories on which uh, my case was, uh, was filed, and it is still an active case, uh, is violation of the Privacy Act. Uh, pursuant to discovery requests, a great number of uh, documents, files, as it were, uh, on me, about me, that have been accumulated by various folks at the White House uh, were submitted pursuant to discovery. Uh, that case was one that was filed under the Privacy Act. If, in fact, uh, your position prevails uh, that the Privacy Act does not cover uh, files that the White House maintains on various individuals, why then would uh, the discovery have gone forward and those files uh, furnished pursuant to discovery? As I understand it, sir, that is the legal issue in the case. The uh, White House and the Executive Office of the President have an obligation to provide documents in a case so that um, the courts can decide the issue. Are you, are you all essentially then trying to have it both ways? I'm not quite sure. If, if you all felt secure in your legal interpretation, and it's one that I disagree with because it flies in the face of the plain language of the Privacy Act, uh, which does not carve out any uh, exemption uh, for the White House or the Executive Office of the President uh, for emails or for uh, hard paper files, uh, why, would, why would you all have actually furnished, pursuant to a Privacy Act case, uh, why would you all have furnished discovery instead of just relying on, on the position that you've enunciated that the Privacy Act doesn't even apply to us? Mr. Barr, that case was filed in a court of law. We were um, uh, requested to make production of documents, and we did so. That, I, I think, is exactly what we do when we get subpoena requests and document productions. We assert and continue to assert that we do not believe that the White House is subject to the Privacy Act, but we have never asserted that that um, enables us uh, uh, to um, ignore a lawful subpoena. We do searches and we make a good faith effort to comply with those subpoenas and we did so in that case. Now though the White House, uh, since the case has been reassigned from Judge Lambert, uh, a judge that takes a somewhat different view uh, of the uh, Privacy Act and various other laws as they relate to the President, now that that case has been assigned to a different judge, the White House has taken a very different position and is resisting. Uh, do you see any inconsistency there? In other words, it seems to uh, fall, the, the White House response to Privacy Act cases and discovery therein seems to fall not so much on principled grounds as it does on uh, whether the case is before a judge that will hold you all's feet to the fire. Uh, Mr. Barr, I, I don't think that's right. I think that I just don't know the particulars of, of this case or the other litigations. Obviously, other lawyers in the office um, deal with those on a day-to-day -day basis. Who, but who I, think that, I think that um, it, it's very important to understand that, uh, as this committee knows, there are times when w the, the documents are um, produced, there are times when there are privileges, there are times when we discuss uh, different timing for productions. There, there are various reasons why productions are made when they are, and uh, depending on what the legal argument is, whether the legal argument is an assertion that the documents don't have to be produced or the legal argument is on the merits itself. So I, I can't speak to that particular case, but. I just wanted to make that clear. Uh, you mentioned the, there are White House attorneys that, uh, that follow these cases, that, that work them. Uh, the, the, the attorneys, and I think we established this earlier, I just want to make absolutely certain, the attorneys at the White House Counsel's Office that are handling, for example, the Filegate case, uh, and cases, are Michelle Peterson and, and, and previously Sally Paxton, is that correct? That's correct, sir. Okay. The, the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, uh, Mr. Shays is next. Uh, Mr. Uh, 
Rabin, uh, have you uh, obtained the names of the lawyers we were talking about? I, yeah, I, I have current information. I don't have the name of the uh, line attorney that probably worked directly with Mr. Barry, but the director then and now of the federal programs branch, which it apparently came from, is a gentleman named David Anderson. I'll continue to work on, or I'm waiting for, if we can determine that. But that David would, Anderson would be over that area? David Anderson, yes, sir, he would and be the so director. And so one of the line attorneys was probably working with Mr. Barry, and you'll have that name for us. I will try to get you that name. I don't I don't exactly know what the holdup is. We would, obviously, I mean, I won't, I won't, no. I will get you that name as soon as I know it. We will have line attorney and, and pending well, we, criminal we, investigation we, we, we matters would, to talk about. If it's possible, we'd like to have that today. Yes. Trying my best, sir. Uh, Mr. Shade. I'm going to yield in one second to Mr. Barr. And, and uh, Ms. Nolan, I should always give you an opportunity to answer questions, so I, th I think your rebuke of, of me was, uh, was a fair one um, on, that, on that side. I want to ask you one um, question, though. It is a hypothetical. Um, and we both may agree on this, but and I'm going to read it slowly. If you were a White House counsel on June 19th, 1998, and if you were informed of a potential omission in subpoena compliance, and if you were told at the time the admission might involve hundreds of thousands of emails, would you feel obligated to inform investigative authorities? I'd be happy to read it over again, if you'd like. Uh, I would certainly um, want to know more about the problem and make sure that there was a problem. Yes, sir. I don't, I don't know that from that meeting. No, I'm not. I but if, and I don't either. I mean, right. nothing's been established. But if you were a White House counsel on June 19th, and if you were informed of a potential omission in subpoena compliance, and if you were told that time, at that time, the admission might involve hundreds of thousands of emails. Would you feel obligated to inform investigative authorities? I, I would feel obligated to uh, look into the matter, sir. I just want to. And, and then, and then what? Well, if if I were informed that there was a potential problem, I looked into the matter and was uh, told, no, the problem's fixed, and there apparently wasn't a problem. I would not feel obligated. No, and sir. And if you uh, found there was a problem. If I found that there was a problem involving um, hundreds of thousands of emails, right. um, then uh, I would do what we're doing now, which is trying to work with the investigative bodies and figure out how to get those emails restored, sir. Uh, let me ask you one last point as it relates to this, though. Would, uh, if you thought it was a potential problem and you looked at it, how many weeks or months do you think uh, you, it would make sense for you to to look at it before you step forward. In other words, should it go on for months? If you thought there was a problem, wouldn't it makes? Wouldn't you feel obligated to say we think there may be a problem, and and we're looking at it, and we, we don't have an answer yet? You wouldn't feel obligated, uh, sir. I would want to know that there's a problem and know the general scope of it. I don't know how long that would take. So if it took six months, you wouldn't necessarily even feel an obligation. I, I, I that. In the absence of sort of knowing what the facts are of those six months, I don't feel like I can answer that. Okay. I would yield my time to Mr. Barr. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, earlier the uh, ranking member had expressed some rather large degree of concern over the cost of uh, the various investigations. Uh, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that uh, the following article dated March 24 of this year from the Copley News Service uh, regarding uh, the fact that uh, the President's latest trip to India and Bangladesh and other uh, exotic locales cost uh, in excess of $50 million. Uh, his trip last a uh, couple of years ago to uh, the African subcontinent cost uh, close to $43 million. Uh, his 10-day trip to China cost close to $20 million. Uh, and uh, a four-day trip to Chile, uh, the bargain of the group was uh, $10.8 million. Uh, knowing that Mr. Waxman pays very close attention to the record in this case and constantly tries to reconstruct it, I'd like that uh, placed in the record. Without objection. Uh, also like uh, to ask unanimous consent that uh, William Sapphire's column in the New York Times today uh, entitled The 100,000 Email Gap and 
the Washington Times article by Jerry Seeper today also entitled, Judge Says Clinton Violated Privacy Act Be Placed in the Record. Uh, without objection, so order. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rabin, I think we established uh, that uh, David Anderson uh, is an attorney at the Department of Justice uh, handling these matters. Is that correct? I'm told, I understand him to be the director of the federal programs branch, which okay. is the Does branch James does James Gilligan, who is, a, I believe, a trial attorney over in the Civil Division, uh, work uh, with him, for him, or is he a superior of his? I believe that he is a subordinate of his. I'll check that and let you know. Okay. Uh, and whose responsibility is it? Uh, it's my understanding that James Gilligan coordinates uh, and communicates on a fairly regular basis involving these cases to, uh, the, uh, to Ms. Peterson. Uh, is that correct? To Ms. Peterson? Ms. Peterson, Michelle Peterson at the, uh, at the White House Counsel's Office. That I have no Maybe idea. Maybe I should direct that to Ms. Nolan. Do they uh, communicate with each other? That's my understanding, sir, yes. Okay, thank the you. The gentleman's time has, uh, has expired. Uh, I want to get back to the questions that we were talking about regarding Mr. Barry. Uh, Mr. Rabin, uh, you said that uh, you don't know anything about uh, uh, anything that a line attorney may have said to him relevant to him saying you don't have to worry about signing this, so you don't know that. Uh, Ms. Nolan, how could the White House Counsel's Office let this affidavit be filed if there was any question about it being false? This is the affidavit we talked about uh, regarding Mr. Barry. Do you yes. have any knowledge about that? Uh, I don't, sir, except to say that, you know, based on my other testimony, I don't believe the White House Counsel's Office would have thought that it was false. And, and as I said earlier, um, I don't believe it is false. Well, that, 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 that's your opinion, and, and I honor that. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk to Mr. Ruff and others about that later. Uh, I prepared a criminal referral uh, regarding this affidavit asking the Justice Department to investigate Mr. Perry, Barry for perjury. Do you agree, uh, uh, Mr. Rabin, that any charges against Mr. Barry should also include an investigation of the role of the Justice Department and White House lawyers in drafting the affidavit? Do I agree that any investigation of Mr. Barry should include? It, it, since they helped prepare the, the document. I can't agree or, di or disagree with that assertion. I will, and I hope this is helpful. I understand that, I, I know that a criminal investigation has begun, and I don't know that any fact <clears throat> which has or will be asserted is off the table in that investigation. Well, if, if the Justice Department did help him prepare the document and did uh, uh, knowingly uh, uh, help him perjure himself by signing an affidavit that was incorrect, which we believe it is, uh, how can they investigate themselves? I mean, the Justice Department has taken this under advisement and they're conducting a criminal investigation. Part of that will involve, I presume, Mr. Barry, since he was one of the principals. I mean, I don't know. Answering the broader and the very important question that, that you're raising now, and I've heard you raise in your opening statement and, and in press accounts, how can the Justice Department investigate itself? Mm -hmm. I think you raise a very good question about how we deal with overlapping inquiries or civil matters and what is now a, a criminal matter. And I am, understand that it is not uncommon. In fact, it is somewhat frequent where a representation of a client agency, which is done under statutory authority, requirement, not simply authority, is proceeding and information comes forward which necessitates the initiation of a criminal inquiry. When that criminal inquiry is initiated, the common procedure, I have learned, is to seek a stay of those aspects of the civil representation that may be implicated by the so, so what criminal you're saying investigation, is that, and that is what has gone on here. So they're asking for a stay in the civil case uh, while they conduct their criminal investigation. I think that would be an overstatement. I, and my understanding of the pleading, which was filed, is staying some aspects mm -hmm. of 
the civil litigation. I don't believe that all aspects of the civil litigation have been requested to be stayed. When did the campaign financing task force learn about the White House email problem? I, I, I don't know. I know that that will be, I presume that will be one of the subject matters of the inquiry itself, which has been initiated, but, but I simply don't know. I do know, I saw in the... So, so you wouldn't know also how the campaign ta uh, financing task force found out about the problem either? I don't know. But uh, if you could get answers to these questions, it would be helpful. You, you have submitted, I, I know that you have sent to the department a series of letters, one of which enumerates these and similar questions, and we will answer those questions. I hope it's expeditiously. I hope so too, sir. Has the ta you, you don't, would you know if the task force ever attempted to interview any of the Northrop Grumman contractors about the problem? I wouldn't know. We, 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 we have learned that the task force attempted to contact Betty Lambeth two weeks ago, but we don't know about any of the others. And so you don't, uh, I guess the next question is superfluous because uh, we, we, we need to know why the task force waited until now to contact the Northrop Grumman contractors. So I guess we'll have to find out who the attorneys were that were involved in this and ask them. In a recent uh, court filing, Justice Department lawyers said that they knew about the problem for over a year. If that's true, why did the campaign finance task force do nothing for over a year? I mean, if they've known about it for a year, I wonder why they haven't done anything. They didn't do anything until I sent a letter to the attorney general. Do you have any answer to that? I know that you posed that question in the letter and we will respond to it. Mr. Horn. I was uh, curious in the last dialogue between us as to were there, were there other places in the White House where messages could go off one's email or one's server. And to your knowledge, do you know of any other part of the White House where there might be messages parked from that period, 93 through 96 through 98? I know of no messages parked, sir. I do know that backup tapes were made of the server at various times and that those backup tapes are um, going to be reconstructed and searched. Okay, so in other words, they hadn't been uh, backup tapes, I take it, when the subpoena went down there and you're saying now that the system is up and running, that there will be backup tapes? Uh, no, sir, there, there have been backup tapes made. Those backup tapes um, are of the server. They're a picture of the server at a particular time. They're not searchable. Um, they are being um, reconstructed so that they can be searched and so that they can be placed on arms. Now, what do you have to do to reconstruct them in order to get a search? Sir, I... I could not tell you that. We, the Office of Administration has retained an outside contractor who uh, will do that work. It's, uh, I don't understand the details of how it has well, to be done. Well, I think the FBI is one that can do the work if anything was done on the mainframe. And uh, then the question would be, uh, can you tell if there are erasures or not? Uh, practically every company, university in the country takes a backup tape every day just in case you've got a surge or an earthquake or a power failure or whatever it is. And so I'm just curious why it took so long to get to this. What motivated them? Was it the president's library and they wanted to check uh, things to be on deposit or what was the motive of this? Sir, Mark Lindsay from the Office of Administration uh, at the time and the assistant to the president for management and administration was here last week and I understand he testified that the office of administration made a determination to make sure they were Y2K compliant. Y2K compliance went through February 29th and then they were to begin the reconstruction. And that's when you really became aware of it? I became aware of it um, somewhat earlier in February, except for the briefing I was given in January in which I did not fully become aware of it, but I was told about a mail to and letter D problem. 
Now, with reference to prior questions you've had on this, it seems to me an outgoing counsel to the president would have a list on a memorandum of either finished, partially finished, or unfinished business. Now, did Mr. Ruff ever pass that on to you and tell you about the subpoenas that uh, and the impact they would have? It's, it's my understanding, sir, that Mr. Ruff did not understand there was a problem with any subpoenas. Um, he did not tell me that there was a problem, which is consistent with my understanding that he didn't understand there was a problem. Well, if usually a new person in a job would start going down the line with your associate or your deputy or your assistant counsels and say, you know, what do you do, and et cetera. Did you do that when I, you entered? I on did that, that Mr. Horn. Yes. You did. And did you learn anything about the tapes through that experience? It is my understanding that no one in the council's office knew that there was a problem with subpoena compliance. Well, what you're telling us is, if we ever have to ask to uh, redo what goes on in the White House under subpoena, that uh, the council's office is not the one to go to. The, it seems to me, I guess the. Uh, Office of Administration, which is a statutory office within the executive office of the president. And they're the ones that know where you can find something on a computer, and I take it the council can't find it. Sir, we found what was on the ARM system, I believe. There were things that were not on the ARM system, and we were not aware of that. Well, let me read you this quote yesterday uh, at the press conference, the president stated that the White House had, quote, turned over everything that had been found, unquote, and that subpoenaed emails were not surrendered because they were located, quote, in a different system, unquote. To what system was the president referring? I, I think the president meant that those emails were not on the ARM system, not that they were in a different system. Now, has that system been searched, or is it a new system and the, not an old one, or the, what? The ARM system is the automated, the online retrieval system. That's the system in which certain emails were not uh, captured or recorded. Um, those are the, the, we now, we have the backup tapes, which are not, uh, we're not designed, as I understand it, for record retrieval, but we're going to have a contractor come in and enable us to retrieve those records on the backup tapes. Now, is the president hooked up to that email system? So he, you've got that, how many accounts? 500 or so of uh, accounts? Of that? I don't know the, the number of accounts in the White House office. It would probably be about that, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, I would think uh, the president would have a very secure email with some of his people in terms of, let's say, national security. Is there such a tape operation and server operation that's separate from what you've described? Except for a couple of um, um, occasions with staff to learn particular computer things, I don't think the president uses email, sir. Well, that's probably a smart idea. And uh, I don't use them either. But uh, the fact is that there's probably another system around there for security reasons. And the question would be, were anything under these subpoenas that could be classified in a security uh, operation? And has that system been looked at? Um, I, I, I don't know the, the answer, sir, to in particular um, requests whether um, that system would have been looked at with respect to classified documents. Is that what you mean, sir? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to know uh, how many systems are there. The, the gentleman's time has expired, Mr. Uh, when Mr. the NSC does do a search, sir, I'm told, of its um, uh, system. Okay, and then are there any others besides NSC? That makes sense to me. And what you've got here, basically, to... I'm told, sir, that there is no other classified system. That that's no the other only, classified only other system, system. Or no other system. The, the other systems, uh, the only automated uh, record systems are the NSC and the EOP-wide one called ARMS. Okay, so everything that you or your staff in the council's office no, you're telling us now in response to these questions. Is that true? 
I'm sorry, sir. Well, do any on your staff know something beyond this? Because you weren't here. Uh, uh, we've, um, uh, I've talked to many people on my staff, and I've had my staff talk to many people who were here who are no longer in the council's office. Uh, we have not found anybody um, uh, who n knew, um, had this information, uh, which I um, am saying I don't believe the council's office had. Mr. Mr. Barr, gentlemen's time uh, Was the president uh, ever informed about the problem with the email system? Um, Mr. Barr, yes, the president was informed. I believe uh, w within the past month, yes. That was that would that was the first time that the president was was informed about this problem. As far as I know, yes, sir. Would anybody have any different knowledge? I don't think so. Was the vice president ever informed about the problem with the email system? I think also within the past month, sir. After the, the news stories broke. What was the response of the president when he was informed about this problem? Um, sir, the president wanted to make sure that uh, we had produced everything we could produce and that we were looking into what to do. And How what was the response of the vice president? I don't know, sir. Who briefed the vice president on this? Um, uh, somebody on his staff, sir, but uh, I'm not sure if it was his counsel or not. Uh, was, uh, was Mrs. Clinton ever informed about the problem with the email system? I don't know, sir. I, I did not inform her. I'm not aware that anyone did, okay, who, other who than would, there have been news accounts about it. Would that have been uh, Ms. Posey? Would she have informed her of that? Oh, it, it, all of this, I think, would have occurred uh, only in the past month. Any, I'm not aware that um, anyone in 1998 informed the president, the vice president, or the first lady. On uh, January 28th of this year, uh, a letter was sent to committee counsel, our committee counsel, Mr. Wilson. Uh, to our, actually, to Ms. Mr. Hollis, but to our counsel uh, regarding the uh, Waco uh, matter. And uh, that letter uh, says, quote, uh, the scope of our recent search for Waco-related materials encompassed all items or documents in any way relevant to the events occurring at the Branch Davidian compound in Mount Carmel outside of Waco, Texas, in February to April 1993. Do I have a copy of that, sir? You're asking me if you have a copy of it? Yeah, uh, the committee provided me with uh, copies of documents. I don't know if Mr. The Lindsay seems to have me a with that. pretty the, large library. Did. Was do, you, staff, do you have one, uh, Mr. Lindsay, with you? I, mean, I can make a copy here, but do you have one? It's GR5. GR5? GR5. Thank you. And it shows a carbon copy to you. Would you see if you can get another copy for we'll Miss Nolan? I have a copy made right now. We we should have another copy up here, I would think. I, uh, Mr. Rabin has it, sir. Okay. You found it? Okay. Uh, the, the, the question is, uh, how can that assertion be true when y'all's testimony is that you don't know whether any relevant emails came into the White House during the August 96, November 98 time frame? At that time, Mr. Barr, uh, I did not know and I do not believe anyone in my office knew that there was a problem with retrieval of certain emails in arm searches. So that, that, that may or may not be a, a complete, full and accurate statement. Which statement is it that you're referring to specifically, now that I have the document, sir? Uh, the one that I read, which is... On I, I'm sorry, I didn't have the document at the time, so i just like some help finding it. Uh, I, I, was, I was going to, I was in the middle of a sentence. Uh, and it appears on page two, the third paragraph, 
The scope of our recent search for Waco-related materials encompassed all items or documents in any way relevant to the events occurring at the Branch Davidian compound in Mount Carmel outside of Waco, Texas, in February to April 93. Yes, sir. What? Yes, sir. That was the scope of our search um, at that time. Yes, sir. Okay. And, and the question is, how can you all make that statement? that assertion, how can, uh, it, it seems to me that it's not true because you don't know whether or not during this time frame here, August 96, November 98, whether any relevant emails came into the White House. Sir, um, the statement is what the scope of our search was. Um, I, I don't believe we've ever been able to say that we have found every possibly relevant document. We do, we make a good faith effort to Well, that's, to that's search. what it says. It says all items or documents in any way relevant to the events occurring at the Branch Davidian compound. The scope of our search encompassed all items or documents. That's what we searched for. We, um, we can never a, be that's sure. A, that's a circular argument. We can never be sure, Mr. Barr, that we've found everything. We can, we make a good faith effort and a very vigorous effort to find things, but we can't be sure that we've ever, I don't think anyone can ever uh, say that I'm absolutely sure I found everything. All, and that letter do doesn't do, say that, Do you all do this sir. with courts also? Sir? Do you, all, do you all do this with courts? Sir, that's... Add, add, a, add a footnote to everything that you all say? There's no footnote, sir. There, there is. You just told me that despite the, the plain language of this, that you have sent us all items or documents in any way relevant to the events occurring. So that is not the plain language. There, I don't see the word sent, it, sent you in there. And what I, what I want to make clear, because I, I don't want this to be about a little, um, uh, you know, sort of word game. That's not what it's meant to be. We identified what the scope of our search was. More importantly, for these purposes, we were not aware that in, in the scope of that search, there might be emails that would not have been retrieved from that search. Despite the fact that we have established that going back to at least 1998, you all knew there was a problem with retrievable emails. We knew there had been or might have been, at least Mr. Ruff informs me, that he knew there had been or might have been a problem that a second search was done, that the documents that were found in that were duplicative, and it's he only did a not partial, believe... There was only a parcel search. Sir, I'm telling you what Mr. Ruff knew and understood in 1998. Well, we we'll, know a great we'll get Mr. Ruff in here to tell us what he knew or should have known. Uh, what I'm saying, though, is the argument that, you all are, that you're using, and it does get back to the, to the, the, the parsing of words and, and the technical uh, sentence structure, something that is, that is so endemic to this administration. What you're saying is a circular argument. You're saying we can, whatever we give you is what we give you. And we may or may not know that there's something that we're not giving you. That's right, sir. That's the, how any document production is done. The, 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 the gentleman's time has expired. We'll get back to him in just a, a little bit. And uh, what, would you like to take a break for about five minutes? Uh, that'd be fine. And then we'll try to wrap this up uh, as quickly as we possibly can. Stand in recess for five minutes. We'll uh, try to reconvene here and wrap this up in the next half hour, if it's all, if it's at all possible. I appreciate your patience today with the, all the questioning, but uh, I think it really is important that we get as many answers as possible today. Uh, where did we end? Was it? Uh, okay. Let me let me start off and try to get some of the questions I need. First of all, I ask unanimous consent that a set of the documents which um, may be used as exhibits at today's hearing and which have been uh, shared with the minority be entered into the record without objection so ordered. We've already cleared that with the minority. Uh, w when the White House belatedly produced videos to the Justice Department in 1997, Mr. 
Ray Ben. The Attorney General stated that she was mad and that she was very disturbed that the tapes had not been produced in a current fashion and that it had taken so long after the production of the tapes to let them know, the Justice Department. Was the Attorney General uh, mad or angry when she found out about the missing emails and uh, had never been, uh, that had never been produced to the Justice Department? Was she angry about that or do you know? I couldn't characterize her, her thoughts on it. When the Attorney General found out there were embarrassing Waco FLIR tapes, she had U.S. Marshals seize them from the FBI. Did she ever consider sending Marshals to seize the backup tapes from the White House? I don't know what she's considered in her mind, sir. I know that she's as interested in being as responsive to you as possible. Is there any concern in the campaign financing task force that the Justice Department lacks the ability to enforce any of its documents requests uh, to the White House or other agencies? Does it lack, uh, in your opinion, the political will to enforce those document requests? Is there concern within the campaign finance task force? Yes. I, I don't know what concern the campaign finance task force might have. I know that they've initiated a, cr an, a criminal investigation. In the Filegate lawsuit, Justice Department lawyers characterized the claim that there were missing White House emails as offensive. The Justice Department lawyers also stated that it is unduly burdensome to perform broad-based searches of archived and backed-up email, especially email stored in non-word searchable format. Given that that's the position of the Justice Department in that case, how can the Department now turn around and investigate the White House? The characterization as offensive is something I would never do. I think that was a mistake. The second part was the undue burden to a particular email retrieval mm -hmm. search. I, 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 have no, I don't have the technical expertise to offer my opinion as to whether it's unduly burdensome. I but think you disagree that, with I think that, excuse me, I'm sorry. You disagree with the term that was used by uh, the Justice Department at the, that the missing emails were offensive? I wouldn't, I never write in that fashion. Do the lawyers on the campaign financing task force believe that it's offensive to suggest that the White House or any other entity under investigation would, would withhold documents? Or have you talked to any of them about that? I'm sorry, I, I, I missed the question, I'm sorry. Do the lawyers on the campaign financing task force believe that it's offensive to suggest that the White House or any other entity under investigation would withhold documents? I really can't characterize what they believe. I think that the people that I've met are hardworking, dedicated, mostly career people who go about their business. Well, they were talking about it being offensive that the White House uh, would withhold documents. So you don't have any, any feeling, you really haven't talked to anybody on the, on the task force about any of this? I haven't heard them, the, the few individuals I've interacted with, I haven't heard them editorialize or, or offer rhetoric like that. Ms. Nolan, uh, you wrote a, a letter to us, and uh, in it, on uh, page, well, the last page of it. Uh, what, what number is that, sir? Uh, I don't know that there's a number on this, is there? It's the March 17th letter you sent to me. Okay, thank you, sir. I just had one question about this. On the last paragraph of that letter, you say the process may be performed in batches, i.e. several backup tapes at a time. If reconstruction were possible, we would likely begin the process with the November 20th, 1998 and June 1st, 1999 backup tapes, approximately 15 tapes total. This process would entail extracting the unrecorded emails from the backup tapes and putting them on a server. Uh, this estimate, and then you go into the time frame and everything, it says this estimate does not, however, include the possible restoration of OVP backup tapes as well as the time and funds needed to perform other steps in the process, such as awarding a competitive contract, searching arms, printing the search results, manually reviewing them, and producing responsive materials. One of the concerns that we have is that some of the batches that we're concerned about start back when this problem occurred in September of 1996. And if you start with the batches at the front end, i.e. the ones most recent, then if you run into a log jam, the chances are, or a problem, the chances are this might not be 
uh, uh, solved or we may not get the documents until well after the November election, which might be fortuitous for those who may be involved. And so what we wanted to know is, uh, assuming, and you said the contract has been signed? Yes, sir. Okay. Assuming a contract's been signed, we would like to know if these uh, uh, emails that could be relevant to our investigation, the campaign finance investigation, which would be the ones going at the beginning of the problem in September of 1996, would be the first batch to be looked at. Um, Mr. Chairman, before I answer that, you, you said something which reminded me I wanted to say that there had been a question earlier, and the contract does include restoration of the OVP um, okay. backup tapes. Um, okay. So thank you for reminding me of that. Okay. Um, secondly, we, uh, as you know, have several investigative bodies we will be dealing with. The reason we talked about the November 98 and June 99 backup tapes first is because they took a picture of the server with everything on the server right before they um, restored, um, uh, started restoring uh, on a going forward basis incoming email to arms. Um, and so that seemed like it might be the quickest way to get a comprehensive picture of what the server looked like. And it would be anything that remained on the server, whether it was from 95 or 96 um, on that day. Then the contractor, as I understand it, the contractor is going to have to get, go through and figure out exactly uh, what we have backup tapes of what dates they are, which ones have emails on it. We haven't made any determination about what order to do that in. I, I hear what you're saying, sir. We're, we're just going to have to work out in terms of timing how we can get this done. Well, we're, we're checking with some computer people as well, and uh, it may very well be that uh, these uh, computer uh, tapes uh, could uh, be mo uh, could could be handled in a much quicker fashion than six months, and so. Uh, if that's well, the case, that I would be delighted, sir. We really have, you know, we originally heard uh, 18 months or three years. Um, I said I want I want us find us to find a way to get it done quicker. The OA has made part of the contract that the contractor is to provide innovative ideas for how to do it. And if we can move up the date, that would be great. Well, we'll, we'll be talking to you about that, uh, Mr. Barr. Uh, Ms. Nolan, just to close the loop uh, on my prior questioning uh, regarding this letter of January 28th, uh, that is approximately, I think, 10 days after you were briefed on uh, this matter. I believe you testified that it was about, was it January 18th or I think so? it was the 19th. It might have been the 18th, sir. I'm not sure. Okay, so you were aware of the email problem at the time this letter was written? Uh, Mr. Barr, uh, as I testified, I was briefed about some problem. I did not understand that it had an effect on email searches. So when the letter said, first of all, though, I, I want to be sure that it's clear that what the letter said, the scope of our search is what we looked for. Um, I, I mean, it's, and, you, you just, uh, I you did just not keep going around in circles on I did that. not know that there was a problem. I understand no, sir. what you're saying. Uh, that is not what the letter says, but I understand this administration. I still don't buy into this argument that you all didn't know the scope of the problem. Uh, it was something that was deemed very important and very serious to the Northrop Grumman experts. Uh, and they briefed, did they not, Mr. Ruff, on this? I don't believe any of, any of the council's office people ever talked to the Northrop Grumman people, no, sir. Okay, Mr. Ruff did not uh, request a discussion with them. He, as I understand it, he received them. information from Mr. Lindsay, Mark Lindsay, the general counsel of the Office of Administration. When did, when did he receive that? Well, uh, you know, sometime in June of 98, sir. What did he receive? Well, that, as, uh, as I've testified, what I know is that Mr. Ruff uh, heard that there was a problem or might have been a problem with an email search that OA then conducted a second search 
that second search showed that there, in fact, had, were no missing emails. He did not understand that there was any ongoing problem. Uh, what did he receive from Mr. Lindsay? I believe he received a copy from Virginia Apuzo of the June 19, 1998 memorandum, and I believe he spoke with Mr. Lindsay. That memorandum wasn't from Mr. Lindsay. That was from Mr. Lindsay's superior, Virginia Puzo. See, I, I, th I think Mr. Ruff received the large number of emails from Mr. Lindsay that Mr. Mr. Lindsay testified last week. He took over to the White House Counsel's office. Those were the emails that uh, were the second search, which um, I am told turned out to be duplicative. Is that what you meant when you said that Mr. Ruff received some materials from Mr. Lindsay? Those documents? Uh, those are the only documents I'm aware of. So he received those I, from Mr. Lindsay? I don't know that Mr. Lindsay physically handed them to what Mr. Did he Ruff. Receive? You testify that he received something from Mr. Lindsay. What did he receive from Mr. Lindsay? Mr. That's what I'm trying to get Mr. at. Mr. Barr, what I know is no, that you, he you received testified from just OA. A few minutes ago. Well, if, if I misspoke, I'm, I'm sorry. What I know is I don't is know that, that you misspoke. I don't I think don't you know did. either, sir. I'm just trying to tell you what I know. You told me what you know. You told me just a few moments ago that I don't Mr. Lindsay received something from, or Mr. Ruff received it from Mr. Lindsay. I'm asking what it was. Maybe somebody could read that back to me, sir. I don't know that I said that. What I said, I think, was that Mr. Ruff received a briefing from Mr. Lindsay. Briefing from Mr. Lindsay? Yes, sir. Okay, so your testimony or, now is not that he received any documents from Mr. Lindsay. I, OA provided documents. I believe that Mr. Lindsay provided them to the counsel's office. I don't know what so I you, don't you know. You don't know who got them either? That's correct, sir. Okay. Nobody over there knows who got them. I We've don't know, sir. established that. Well, Mr. Lindsay doesn't even remember who he gave them to. Why do you take the position, contrary to the testimony last week, that those documents that were sent over there, that box of a thousand or however many emails, was a complete search? It was never a complete search. I've Nobody never ever said, said that, that it sir. Was. Well, then how do you know that there weren't other documents that were relevant to these subpoenas, such as the Waco subpoena? such as the subpoenas from the independent council, I've such never, as the subpoena from this committee. I have never said I don't know. I have said that what I understand from Mr. Ruff, what he understood at a time when I was not there, sir, what I understand from Mr. Ruff is that he understood there was or might have been a problem. He understood that a search had been done. I've never said it was a complete search or what he understood about the, the nature of the search. I don't know, sir. Mr. Chairman, am I missing something here? Didn't this witness just testify to that? Mr. I guess we should ask Mr. Waxman. He records this stuff. And <laughs> Mr. Barr, uh, your time's expired. Uh, I'd be happy to yield you uh, more time in just a second. Uh, I, I would like to uh, ask Mr. Rabin if he's uh, heard back from the Justice Department about the attorney that worked on Mr. Berry's uh, sworn affidavit. I have heard back. My uh, understanding as of 513 um, is that the pool of attorneys that would have could have interacted with the gentleman's uh, affidavit is, uh, as appears on the public filings, Ann Weissman, James Gilligan, Elizabeth Shapiro, Allison, I believe it's pronounced Giles, G-I-L-E-S. So uh, there is another attorney uh, on the filing, uh, Julia Covey, but their understanding as of 513 is that she is not among the pool of attorneys who would have interacted, but as I get okay, more information, so, so, I'll let you so know. So let me have those names again, their full names of the ones. These are the, these are the, I will give it to you, but these are the attorneys who appear on the public filings in the civil case. David Anderson, as I said before, is the director uh -huh. of the federal programs branch. The other names that appear on the filing, in addition to David Ogden and Wilma Lewis, uh, are Ann Weissman, James Gilligan, Elizabeth Shapiro and Allison Giles, and except for Mr. Anderson, I understand all of those to be line attorneys in the civil division. Now, so, so what you're saying is one of those probably was the one that worked with him on his sworn affidavit. Our understanding as of right now is that uh, at, at least one, it's possible that more would have interacted. Okay, well, the reason yet. I ask is because we'll be issuing subpoenas 
for them and I want to make sure that we don't unduly burden the others who may not have been involved so I, I understand that and I, I expect I, I suspected that you would send subpoenas to those people and I expect that we'll we'll try to have conversations with you about our okay. line attorney policy and our pending criminal right. case policy would uh, would both witnesses both of you agree to answer uh, written questions uh, questions put to you by the committee uh, so that we could include them in the record and if so uh, we'll hold the record open for those answers is there any problem with that with either one of you no sir no problem no, no sir okay, thank you uh, Mr. Barr, do you have any more questions of uh, the council? We want to give the council some time. He has a few questions that he'd like to summarize with. Uh, yeah, but uh, if, you're, if you have more questions, go ahead. One of the areas that we uh, went into uh, last week with uh, the other Mr. Lindsay was something that he, he, used, he kept using a term, and finally we, we asked him what was this term, what did it mean, mission-critical project. Have you ever heard of that term? Uh, not till today, sir. I don't think I've heard it. Okay, you didn't hear it last week. We spent quite uh, some time with him uh, going I, over it. I did not. I saw some, but not all of Mr. Lindsay's testimony. Okay. Uh, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman, for counsel. We'll now yield to the counsel for some questions. What's that? Ms. Nolan, good afternoon. Mr. Rabin, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, just to clarify things for the record, you've told us today that you've had a, conversations with, with um, former White House counsel uh, Charles Ruff, correct? Yes, sir. How many conversations have you had with Mr. Ruff since the uh, uh, newspaper articles first made you aware that there was a problem with the, the email um, situation? I think uh, two or three. I'm not sure. Uh, two or three. Okay, now, just so we can be precise here, if you would, please tell us everything he told you about his various uh, exposures to this problem. What did he tell you? Um, he told me that he uh, was informed that there was or may have been a problem uh, with an email search that he um, uh, spoke uh, with Mark Lindsay about it, that he, uh, that OA had conducted a second search and that as far as he knew, that search had shown that there were no missing emails and that he therefore thought there was no problem. Okay, fair enough. Now, with, with uh, the time that he spoke with um, Mr. Lindsay, did he tell you whether other people were involved in, uh, well, tell us, was this a meeting that he had with Mr. Lindsay or a telephone conversation? Um, I know, I think he said that he met with Mr. Lindsay, but um, I'm not sure. You know where he met with Mr. Lindsay? I don't. Do you know if anybody else was in the meeting? I don't. Have you reviewed any records in the last week? We, we received records indicating that on uh, the 19th of June, Mr. Lindsay had a meeting with uh, Mr. Ruff and an individual whose name is Mills, and I assume that's Cheryl Mills. Have you reviewed records about meetings? I have seen that, that calendar entry, yes. Okay. What does that calendar entry mean? Uh, it means that at that time he had a meeting set up with uh, Mr. Lindsay and Ms. Mills. I don't know if he had it, if uh, all three people were present. I just don't know. Well, it's, it's fair to say you've not asked him whether he... Uh, actually did have the meeting with those individuals? Uh, uh, he, uh, he remembered that he had met with Mr. Lindsay. I think he remembered that he had discussed it with Ms. Mills. I did not ask if she was in the meeting at the time. I'm not sure that she was. So since you've received the documents, you've not asked him the question, did you meet with Mr. Lindsay and Ms. Mills on this issue? He'd Is already told me that he had discussed it with Ms. Mills. 
Uh, did he discuss it with Ms. Mills at a different time than he discussed it with Mr. Lindsay? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. So you, you, is it fair then to say that you have not asked him whether he met with Mr. Lindsay and Ms. Mills at the same time? In the same, at the same time, I don't believe I've asked him that, no, sir. Fair enough. Um, I guess the threshold issue here is you've told us what Mr. Ruff said. Do you believe Mr. Ruff's story? I do. Okay. Um, I mean, the problem, it's, it's been stated a number of times, and I, I have a few very specific questions about the, uh, the test search that was done, but the problem, obviously, for us is that there were a number of employees who knew there was a serious problem uh, within days of their elevating the problem to their superiors. A memo was produced from an assistant to the president to the deputy chief of staff to the president, who's well regarded and is the current chief of staff to the president. Uh, at, at almost contemporaneous time, uh, a briefing was held uh, where Mr. Lindsay explained the problem to Mr. Ruff. And the problem that, that we're confronted with right now is almost everyone seems to have understood the parameters of the problem except Mr. Ruff. And, and so did Mr. Ruff give you any indication of how it was that he did not become aware of the basic parameters of this problem? Um, I, I just want to say that I'm not at all sure that everyone, uh, it's clear to me from the testimony and from memos that people began to understand the parameters of the problem. Um, it is not at all clear to me that everyone understood them at all. And believe me, when I started asking questions in February of this year, the, it wasn't clear to me that everyone understood the parameters of the problem. Well, clearly not every computer glitch results in a memo to the deputy chief of staff and a contemporaneous meeting with the council of the president. And, and there was, as we learned last week, uh, there are some differing recollections, but there was great concern as to what the problem was. And, and let me just read you a couple of statements that Mr. Barry, uh, Mr. Barry made in uh, emails. And they were admittedly after the fact, but, but Mr. Barry says in one email, I feel that the records must be recreated and any searches need to be reperformed if the requesters feel it's necessary. This is a daunting proposition, but I do not see any other alternative. Uh, in another email, um, Ms. Gallant, who was the uh, associate director of the IS&T division, says, I also agree with Tony about the new searches that will have to be done. We need direction from OA Council on that front. Uh, and, and I'll leave this because I have some very specific questions, but it, it seems fairly clear to us that there was a concern that there was a universe of documents that had not been searched for responsiveness to subpoenas, which takes me to, I guess, the, the real question. Mr. Ruff, um, you've told us, was concerned that there was a, uh, a search, and the search indicated that uh, there were no... Uh, emails that had not been produced to any requesting body. Is that correct? I'm sorry, could you repeat? I just want to make sure that your right. characterization Ms. of what Ms. I've said is, is accurate. Sure, the, I, I guess this was my characterization, but there was a search conducted by computer programmers, Northrop Grumman computer contract mm -hmm. employees, uh, and the search involved uh, terms that uh, had Monica Lewinsky in them. Is that correct? It was a search related to the Monica Lewinsky investigation. I don't know what the terms were. Okay. I, ha I well, haven't that, seen the search. That was my next question. What was the search? I, I don't know. Mr. Haas was here last week. He's the one who did the, the search. I, as I testified earlier, have not uh, uh, seen what's on uh, his F drive, what he saved of the search. Have, have you made any inquiries as to what the search was? Uh, I have made inquiries. I have not yet determined exactly what it was other than related to the Monica Lewinsky um, matter. So at this point, you just don't know what the search was. Is that that's a fair? I don't know summary. what terms he used or what exactly he was searching for. No, I do not. OK. Do you know, as you sit here today, whether this was a comprehensive search for all of the material about Ms. Lewinsky that would have been requested by the independent counsel? I don't know what the search was. Okay. Now, I, I guess this takes us to the real concern. Um, if you don't know what the search was, um, did you ask Mr. Ruff what the search was? Uh, Mr. Ruff did not have any details um, for me. I don't think, uh, I don't know if he doesn't remember or if it, his, his recollection is that OA took care of doing a search for these emails. I, I don't know the details of it. And, and, and who requested the search? 
Uh, you know, I, I don't, that is one thing I don't know. I believe council's office did, but I don't know if OA said they would do it. I just don't know the answer. Well, this is a matter of great importance to us for the next few questions I'll ask, but have you asked anybody in the council's office about this search? Yes. And, and, and what did they tell you? Did they request a search? I don't recall whether the council's off. I don't recall hearing that the, that anyone in the council's office requested the search. I don't know if Mr. Ruff requested it. Um, I, I, I just don't know. The reason I, I mention this at this point and, and believe that it's of great importance is because the search that was was actually conducted appears to be a, a very, very uh, minor or preliminary type of search. Uh, it appears to uh, have involved a request for documents that pertain to one individual, and we were told four other individuals. But it doesn't appear to be a particularly all-encompassing search. Is that your understanding of this particular Lewinsky search? Uh, that's my general understanding. As I said, I haven't seen the search, but it's my understanding that Mr. Ruff had been told there had been a problem or understood that there was a problem with a particular search and that another search was being done to see if there was a problem with that particular search. Okay. So I don't, I don't know that anybody okay. was thinking Fair about enough. an all-encompassing search. Fair enough. Now, now, we were told by the employees that when they did the search, they, they came up with three reams of documents. And I originally asked if that's a, about this many documents, and, and I was told it was about this many documents. That's what we were told last week. Now, now the question is, if this was a very preliminary search, and it, it showed a fairly significant universe of documents, maybe duplicative, maybe not, but a fairly large universe of documents, did anybody, did, did, have you discussed with Mr. Ruff whether he said, maybe we better go back and do a comprehensive search because there is a problem? Um, no, as, as I've said, it's my understanding that what was provided to the council's office, and I don't know if what was provided was this amount or this amount, I don't know. But what was provided to the council's office was checked against what the council office, council's office already had um, been provided. Right, but, but would, let me, uh, excuse let me, me, let me would, make would my... Count, would council yield for just a moment? Uh, I'm sorry to... Uh, uh, but uh, with regard to the, the, the sort of the line of reasoning and, and the position that you all are taking with regard to the subpoena from this committee with regard to, uh, or your conclusion, that however many documents there were here, and I think we've established that there were quite a few uh, subject to the search that Mr. Haas conducted, or was directed to conduct and did conduct, uh, that somebody made a, a determination that they were duplicates of others that had already been provided pursuant to the subpoenas uh, to the Congress was a similar conclusion reached and conveyed to the courts in any pending civil litigation that documents, none of these documents were going to be sub, uh, furnished to the court because they were determined to be duplicative by the counsel's office? Uh, Mr. Barr, uh, it's my understanding that the counsel's office determined that they had already produced whatever those documents were. So they made this determination that these documents were duplicative and therefore for all purposes, whether it was the independent counsel, a congressional committee, or a civil action, and therefore none of them were going to be produced because they already had been. It is, again, my understanding that Mr. Ruff understood there was a problem with a particular search, and it was that search um, that uh, they were looking to, to um, See I'm, if I'm, I'm not opening that documents. can of worms again. I'm, I'm not sure we're going to get anywhere on that. But just with regard to the determination that you say was made, that with regard to these documents the council is asking you about now, that they were not furnished to anybody because they were deemed to be duplicative. The, that applies to not only the request from this committee, the subpoena, but to anybody else that had asked for those, including the courts or the independent council. I apologize, sir. It may be having been here for this long, I'm having trouble following, but I don't understand the question. There was a search done with respect to one subpoena 
in one investigation. That was, as I understand it, what Mr. Ruff understood there might have been a problem about. He didn't understand that there was a problem about any other search or any other investigation. So I'm, not, I'm just not sure how to answer your question. But weren't, weren't, the, weren't these documents subject to a number of different requests, including but not necessarily limited to the independent counsel, this committee, the impeachment committee, and possibly other civil actions. Documents that would have been responsive. That relate, for example, to Ms. Lewinsky, possibly Waco. All I'm saying is, you made that you're saying that Mr. Ruff made the determination that for purposes of one subpoena, these documents that Mr. Haas uncovered were duplicative and therefore they were not submitted pursuant to that one subpoena. And that's the only problem he understood might have existed. Okay. Were those documents then submitted to any other outside requestor, such as the independent counsel, a, a party in a civil action, or the impeachment committee? I, I, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't understand. No, maybe, maybe counsel, you can ask, ask with a little more clarity. Well, let me just pick up on something you just said here. It's a, it's a gentleman, Gil. What they're asking is the duplicates. Were they provided to anybody other than? No, I think that the... the I mean, once it was decided they were duplicates, you didn't provide them to anybody not else? Not that I'm aware of, no. They were, they were duplicates uh, with respect to a particular subpoena request by um, uh, a particular investigator, I believe the independent counsel. I don't, if, if, if those, kind, those uh, emails were requested by another investigative body, the counsel's office did have them already. Um, but I, I don't know if they were, sir. The duplicate uh, search, however, as I understand it, was related just to this one request. Okay, let me pick on that up, if I may, because everything you've said flies in the face of everything we've been told. You, you just indicated that there was a, you know, what was taken to Mr. Ruff was pursuant to a search request following from a subpoena. And what we've been told, and, and disabuse me of this uh, error if I'm wrong, what we were told is that individuals identified a problem and did a, a test using a very prominent and in the news name at the time to determine whether there were documents in this vast universe of information that would be, uh, that would show that there was in fact a big problem. And so consequently what we've been told is that there was not a specific subpoena request trying to track down all the information pertaining to Monica Lewinsky. We've been told that there were requests made, uh, that, that, that there was a uh, a test made to see what was in this universe of documents on the server at the time, and they used the name Monica Lewinsky, and they used some other names. But what you're telling us now is quite different, and well, I wanted to follow up on the point I was just making. Can I make clear that I'm telling you what um, I understand Mr. Ruff understood at the time? Right. I, I uh, uh, cannot tell you what uh, search was actually done, as I've said, or um, what terms were used or how it was decided to do it. I don't know the answers to that. So I don't think what I'm telling you is different. I'm just telling you what Mr. Ruff understood at the time. Right, no, and I appreciate that, and that's why I asked my initial question, and, and, and that's very helpful. But the, the search, and I guess this goes to, you know, what happened in the meeting with Mr. Ruff. Trying to keep sight of the forest and, and just get the trees out of the way here, the search was a very, very uh, insignificant type of search. It wasn't the, the search, from what we've been told, that White House Counsel's uh, office constructed to determine what would be responsive to the Lewinsky subpoena. It was just a simple search asking for information about Lewinsky and some individuals. And to my way of thinking, any responsible lawyer would have looked at that search, seen there was a lot of documents, and said, gee, we ought to do a really thorough search. But that's not your understanding of this. Uh, it's not my understanding that Mr. Uh, I don't know what Mr. Ruff knew about the search or the kind of search it was. It's it's not my understanding that he knew it was, as you characterize it, a simple search or that it even was a simple search. I, I don't know, and I'm not able to testify about that. 
See, this is important to us because all day you've been representing that the, the Lewinsky documents were duplicative, and, and that really went to the issue of there's not really a big problem here because these were duplicative documents. The I've, point, the point I've I'm been making representing uh, uh, what Mr. Ruff and the counsel's office understood at the time, and I continue to represent that. Um, but I just want to make clear that that's all I'm able to testify uh, about. I wasn't there. I didn't have any independent understanding. Um, the Northrop Grumman employees who you, you had here last week, who you were able to um, uh, talk to, have been represented by Northrop Grumman counsel. I've not talked to them. Um, so my information is as I've presented it, and I, I just want to be clear about what, I'm, what I am testifying. Okay, I understand. Now, I, I just... Just to recapitulate, and I'll move away from this in a moment, but the point I guess I'm making here is that um, our understanding is that the search that was conducted uh, was conducted to, to show that there was a systemic problem. A, a, a significant issue had arisen. A search was conducted that showed, yes, there was that problem. And your testimony, and I know you're telling us what Mr. Ruff has told you, but your testimony uh, is that, that Mr. Ruff did not perceive in the meetings that he had that there was a systemic problem. And our understanding is that everything that was done showed that there was a problem with the system, and yet it seems that everybody but Mr. Ruff knew that there was a problem with the system, and yet there is a disconnect here. And I do, you, I, uh, there is a disconnect. I think I testified to that. I think there's no question about that, that the, the people who knew the technology knew things that the council's office uh, who were producing documents did not know. There, uh, there's absolutely no question there was a disconnect. I, I do want to say again, though, that um, I, I don't agree with the characterization that everyone else knew. I, I just, I don't have any information that suggests that's the case. Some people knew. The technical people knew. The emails that have been referred to throughout this day don't seem to have been sent beyond the technical people. Um, and it, it is also true that uh, certain people in a way, other than the technical people who were sending the emails, uh, did know that there was a problem and, and have known that there was a problem. That was, that disconnect occurred. There's no question about that. Well, fair and, and the other thing I just wanted to mention is I, I don't know that Mr. Ruff had meetings on, that you referred to meetings. I'm aware that he discussed this with Mr. Lindsay. I, uh, I don't know, um, you know, if it was in a face-to-face -face meeting if there was more than one discussion. I don't know that. No, I can understand that. But one of the problems we have is you've had conversations with Mr. Ruff, and, and you come here and you're not even sure if there were meetings on this subject, which obviously means we have to go into the next phase. Well, let me just let me leave that now because, you know, we, there are two different uh, opinions on this matter at this point. Um, earlier, uh, a number of members had asked you questions about when you first realized that something was wrong and that something needed to be done. And we sort of danced around the fact there was a newspaper article and there was a filing in a civil lawsuit. Can, I, if I you, didn't mean to dance. I, I didn't know dancing. If I was dancing if, with someone, I was if, unaware of if it. You, if you could, if you could, if you could try and pin it down with, with specificity, when did you first know that you would have to go back and reconstruct the emails? I can't pin that down with specificity. I did not know there was a problem that would uh, uh, require us to reconstruct until sometime last month um, for, for purposes of our productions. I did know in January that OA was going to reconstruct some things for federal records. Um, I, I just, uh, and that they were going to proceed with that. Sometime last month, I realized that it was a problem that would have affected our ability to retrieve certain emails that uh, uh, were requested. Okay, when, when, you learned of, when you learned of the problem, or when it first became apparent to you that there was this significant problem, uh, did, did you meet with the contract employees who, well, let me ask this, have you ever met with the contract employees who were originally aware that there was a significant problem? Um, as I've said, almost right away, those contract employees were represented by Northrop Grumman Council. We um, tried to talk to their counsel several times. We weren't able to talk with them. Well, I mean, I have a recollection of that because I was very involved. The newspaper article occurred, and it was a, a number of weeks before Northrop Grumman Council was retained. Did you make a, an effort in the interim 
to uh, We certainly talk talked to, to people in OA. I don't know who people in OA talk to, um, but they, of course, the, the, the contract employees, and I think there was testimony about this last week, there are appar well, apparently quite strict rules about who in the complex talks to contract employees and, and through whom, um, as I think you know. Is it, it's correct to say then that right after the newspaper article uh, from the Washington Times that, that basically identified this problem came out, you did not in the first week make an effort to talk to the contract employees. Is that a fair characterization? I don't know. I just don't know. Well, I, I guess um, if, you could, if you could please tell us when you first did make, uh, provide for, for the written record afterwards. Uh, uh, what are you asking me to tell you? I'm sorry. When, when you first made an effort to uh, reach out to the contract employees to understand I will what the see if I can was. get that information. Um, just a couple, a couple last questions. Um, just one, one last subject. This is due diligence here because it's a different type of document that we've had, I guess, misunderstandings with or problems with. So I'll ask you about telephone records um, so that we can get a, a definitive answer about telephone records. It, it's been reported in the press and obviously that doesn't make it right, but it's been reported in the press that there are White House telephone records dating back to 1993. Are you aware of the existence of any telephone records related to any telephone calls going either into or out of the White House? Uh, I'm not. Okay. Is this a subject that you've ever uh, had any discussions about? Um, I. Uh certainly asked with reference to when this email issue came up. Um, I was also made aware that there had at some point been um, a claim about the telephone records. I asked um, uh, uh, one of the attorneys in my office who had handled the case, again, Michelle Peterson. Um, she informed me that at the time uh, she had spoken um, uh, with Cheryl Hall about the matter, who told her that there was uh, no truth to that allegation. We determined that there were no such records. That's what I know about it. Who first made you aware of, of the allegations that there were telephone records? Um, I, I, I don't know. It came up at some point with respect uh, after I was aware of this email issue. I just don't know who it was. Are you aware of whether any of your predecessors in the White House Counsel's Office have ever attempt, attempted to definitively determine whether there are uh, telephone records? And, and I'm being as broad as humanly possible here. Any type of record in any form whatsoever relating to any type of telephone call either coming out of or going into the White House? Uh, I'm not aware. I can tell you that when I was an associate counsel at some point between 1993 and 1995, um, uh, whoever was counsel then, I believe it was Judge Mikva, asked me um, uh, uh, whether we had the capability to retrieve certain telephone records. I made an inquiry to the Office of Administration and was told we did not and conveyed that to Mr. Mikva. That's the only thing I know about it. Well, I'll, I'll leave this line of questioning, but if, if you could provide for us a definitive answer. I, I, know, I know you've told us right now that you are not aware of any records, but if, if you can check this and provide a definitive answer after the hearing as to whether there are any records in any format whatsoever of telephone calls going into the White House or coming out of the White House. Um, if you could provide that for the record, we'd be greatly appreciative. Will, will you do that? Yes, yeah, certainly we'll look and see. We will get back to you on that. I will provide them if I can, yes. So I, I, will, I will look and give you an answer to your question. Good. Thank you okay. very much. Thanks. Thank you, Council. Uh, Councilor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Nolan, in the interest of time, I'm not going to ask you a series of questions. The only question I have for you is, do you have some information that you were willing to share or, or ready to share with the committee today, but nobody asked you the right question? <laughs> and so there's a question that you're ready to answer, but we just haven't figured out how to ask it. I, I don't think so. I, <laughs> I, I think I've... Uh... Nothing else you want to say? No, sir. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me conclude by asking one last question. You keep using the term subpoena request. My counsel has noticed this time and again. And uh, if you look at the documents we serve on you, they're, they're just called subpoenas. Uh, why do you call them subpoena requests? I don't know. <laughs> it's just how I refer to them, but I, I just I wondered don't. if maybe there was a different legal definition that the White House applied to our subpoenas because they're pretty they're supposed to produce, you know, documents or appearances and I you don't have any No, uh, no, I mean a, a subpoena sometimes does have a number of different elements of it. Mm -hmm. Um and it may be sometimes that somebody talks about a subpoena request as an element of a subpoena, but I'm not sure that I use that Okay. those terms um, consciously. All righty. Well, I want to thank you for your patience and uh, 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 your ability to sit there that long and answer all these questions. Uh, you, you have been helpful, and uh, we will continue to pursue this matter. We stand adjourned. Thank you.